the Metro Historic Zoning Commission meeting of April 21, 2021. I will take roll of the commissions that are in attendance and please say present when I call your name. I don't think Vice Chair Stewart is online yet, but he may join us later. Commissioner Fitz? Present. Commissioner Jones? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Mayhall? Present. Commissioner Mosley? Present. Commissioner Price? Present. And Commissioner Williams? Present. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners, for your time. And Chair, uh, this is Commissioner Johnson. I'm present. Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, I apologize, Commissioner. Apologize. I didn't have you on our list, and I will now put you on there. Thank you. Okay. Out of the abundance of caution, and pursuant to recommendations from federal, state, and local health agencies regarding avoiding group gatherings due to the COVID-19 coronavirus, this meeting is a teleconference meeting. Advanced public comments were possible through email, mail, and voicemail. The commission must vote on the record that the COVID-19 pandemic requires us to hold a telephonic meeting as permitted under the governor's executive order. And I will entertain a motion on this statement. Commissioner Mayhall. Uh, so moved. Okay. I have a motion. Is there a second? Okay. Um, Commissioner Mayhall, I, I will so I'll just go ahead and recite the uh, the technical term. Sure. And it says, Sure. sure. Do you have Do you have that? I'm sorry, Commissioner. I do. It, I do. Um, okay. The COVID-19 pandemic requires the Metropolitan Historic Zoning Commission to hold a telephonic meeting as permitted under the Governor's Executive Order Number 65. I so move that we approve the telephonic meeting. Okay. There is that motion, and Commissioner Jones. I second the motion. Okay. I'll take the roll call on the motion. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you. As a reminder, we will take live comments via phone, and that phone number is 629-255-1911. And please hold your call until the project you wish to speak about is announced. And for those who have logged in as panelists, you do not also need to call. Pursuant to the provision of Section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, Notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via a statutory writ of certiorari. You're advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the decision, specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes, and they may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal of public comment. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. At this time, there were no such requests and no voicemails have been received. Members of the public calling in will be heard. And Ms. Ziegler, are there any proposed changes to the agenda? 
Yes, there are three that have requested deferral, 1716 Greenwood, 1017 North 16th, and 313 Broadway. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, is there any discussion about this revision? Okay, I see no hands raised, and I entertain a motion of the agenda change. Commissioner Price? Yes, I move that we accept the changes to the agenda. Thank you, and Commissioner Fitz? Um, I second that motion. Okay, there's a first and a second. I will call the roll. Yes or no, Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Okay, I think we heard you. Commissioner yes. Mayhall? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. And that was Commissioner Mayhall, correct? Yes, and, and okay. uh, Commissioner Jones said yes as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you, Commissioners. And before we begin the first case, Ms. Ziegler, are there any council members who wish to speak? Yes, Council Member Cash is on the line. Okay. Council Member Cash? Uh, thank you. I, I uh, thank you for recognizing me. I uh, don't have any comments right now, but may if uh, when some of my districts uh, matters come up. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And Council Member Withers. And Council Member Withers. Uh, thank you, Chair, so much for recognizing me. Um, I, too, will wait uh, for some of the District 6 items to uh, come up on the agenda. I think some of them are a little bit later on the agenda, but I look forward to the discussion and will uh, raise my hand if I need to comment. There's one item where I've emailed in comments, and it's fine just to read that into the record if you feel the need to do that. But if any other items uh, require discussion, I'm uh, happy to uh, request to be recognized at that time. Thank you so much. Thank you, council members. We appreciate your your time and uh, your generous time to be with us uh, this afternoon and to give your comments and recommendations as well. Uh, first in our agenda is approval of the minutes for March 17, 2021. Uh, does anyone have any comments or revisions to the minutes? And I do not see any raised hands. So I will entertain a motion. Commissioner Williams. Move to approve the minutes. Thank you, sir. Is there a second? Commissioner Mayhall? I second that motion. Okay, there is a first and a second. And I will take the roll. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Jones, you might um, increase your volume a little bit. We It's uh, weak coming through on our signal. Thank you. Now is the time for the public to call in if someone would like an item removed from the consent agenda by calling 629-255-1911. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Items removed from the consent agenda will be moved to the end of the agenda. Ms. Sajit will read the cases proposed for the consent agenda and then we will uh, see if anyone has any items to be removed for discussion. Thank you, Ms. Sajit. Yes. So the first item on consent is approval of the administrative permits issued for the month. 1033 Chickamauga Avenue is for an addition with setback determination. 
The request for 1405 Jakes Avenue is for an addition. 1907 Shelby Avenue is a request for an addition. 2004 Natchez Trace is for an addition. Uh, the request at 2207 18th Avenue South is for an addition and outbuilding. An addition, DADU, and setback determination are planned for 1918 Ashwood Avenue. The project for 1406 Fifth Avenue North is an addition, outbuilding, and partial demolition. An addition and DADU are proposed for 1901 Sweetbriar Avenue. The project for 3709 Central Avenue is an addition. An addition with setback determination is proposed for 1206 Fatherland Street. And the request for 104 Craighead Avenue is for an addition and is a revision to a previously approved plan. Uh, staff recommends approval of these projects along with their applicable conditions as noted in the staff reports. Thank you, Ms. Sajit. Are there any requests from the public? First of all, if you do, raise your hand. I see them. We haven't received anything in advance and there are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ziegler. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions on the consent or is there a motion? I have a long list of names, so bear with me. Um, Commissioner Fitz? I would like to move for approval of the consent agenda. Thank you. Commissioner Price? I second the motion. Okay, there is a first and a second, and we will vote on the motion. I will call on the commissioners. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Thank you. I do, we do hear you much better. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you. Just as a reminder, those who are applicants and have signed in via WebEx, please do not also call in. Be some confusion on, on those um, technical uh, items. If you were unable to log in or you are a member of the public wishing to speak on a case, please call 629-255-1911 when the case you are interested in comes up. And now is the time for anyone to call if they have public comment regarding the proposed consolidation of the design guidelines for most of the neighborhood conservation zoning overlay. And um, first I want to be sure as we thank the staff and also all the community meetings that have been held um, for this um, huge project. And uh, we know there'll be some um, comments and I will turn that over to Ms. Ziegler. Thank you so much. Yes, the Historic Zoning Commission received funding from the Tennessee Historical Commission for this project, which began in January, 2019. The grant period ended on September 30th, 2019. There have been multiple stakeholder meetings, community meetings, and six public hearings that have been held with the intent of voting on the final product in March, 2020. But that meeting of course was canceled due to COVID. So we've deferred the case each month, but did not receive additional public comment until the last two months. In addition to meetings, staff created an email list of every email available in Metro's permitting software program for the last two years that was linked to a preservation permit and collected emails from public comment sent via email on other projects in recent years. This list was used to inform about community meetings, encourage people to take part in the online discussion board, and to let interested parties know when revisions were available on the website. Meetings were also promoted via social media. Offers were made to all relevant neighborhood associations for staff to attend a meeting that they scheduled specifically for this topic or just to attend a regularly scheduled meeting. A community meeting, the September 2019th public hearing and this March 2021 public hearing all received mailed notices. A Nashville.gov webpage dedicated to the project, which included a description of the project, links to the online discussion board, design guideline drafts, 
meeting notes, videos, and links to additional resources have all been available for approximately two and a half years. A direct link for, to this page is available on the Zoning Commission's homepage. An online discussion board ran from February to September 2019. Metro Nashville has 22 neighborhood conservation zoning overlays, all with their own individual set of design guidelines that are largely very similar. While having a set of design guidelines for each district worked just fine when there were just a handful of conservation overlays, today, 22 separate documents of design guidelines is cumbersome. So the idea is to consolidate the various design guidelines while still preserving the important differences between the neighborhoods. Unlike the adoption of conservation overlays, which change zoning, the guidelines are not reviewed by planning and council because they don't change the zoning. Instead, the document is adopted by the Historic Zoning Commission only. The original document and all revisions must meet the Secretary of Interior standards developed by the National Park Service. So this project is only for some neighborhood conservation zoning overlays and it does not affect other types of historic uh, zoning overlays. Neighborhood conservation zoning overlays not included as part of this revision are Belmont Hillsboro, Hillsboro West End, and Richland West End. Initially, the Elmington neighborhood said that they did not want to be included, but they now would like to be included. But since they didn't receive a notice, we are proposing holding a public hearing specifically for that neighborhood to join the consolidation at the May meeting, assuming it is adopted at this meeting. No new overlays are part of this proposal. No boundary changes are proposed. If you do not live or own in an existing conservation overlay currently, then this project does not apply to you. There are multiple goals for this project. One goal is to provide clear direction for property owners and applicants. All guidelines are almost the same as a set created decades ago. A lot has changed over the years in terms of how the commission interprets design guidelines and we think it'll be useful to reflect those changes in the language of the design guidelines. In addition, the um, state office, state preservation office also recommends that guidelines are revised at probably about every 10 years. We're well past that deadline. Along those same lines in the current guidelines, some sections are primarily italicized language and need to be updated. Italicized language is information added to the guidelines without a formal process to explain how the commission has interpreted an existing design guideline. The goal is to make most of the italicized language formally part of the guidelines in this process. Another goal is to address actions not contemplated when the guidelines were originally written. We also think this project will make the process easier for applicants, particularly those that, repeat, that are repeat applicants who work in multiple neighborhoods. It'll help them to better understand what guidelines are universal to all conservation overlays and what, if any, differences there are for individual neighborhoods. We, we propose to change the, uh, excuse me, we propose to change the title of the cons consolidated design guidelines to clarify that it's for turn of the century neighborhoods, roughly those built between 1890s to the 1950s. These are Nashville neighborhoods where Queen Anne, Folk Victorian, Craftsman bungalows, tutors, and minimal traditional houses are common. Last month, you approved a new set of design guidelines that address the different styles, forms, and development patterns of mid-century neighborhoods. The draft guidelines are divided into two parts. Part one is, the most, is most of the guidelines and includes guidance that applies to all of the districts. Part two includes a chapter for every individual district with any guidelines that may be specific to that district. So at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Melissa Sajid. The guidelines are reorganized and some info is repeated in each section so the user doesn't have to flip back and forth. It's this repetition that makes the draft guidelines look longer than the original guidelines. New terms are added and some terms revised in the glossary section. The section will remain as italicized information, which means that the terms are not actual guidelines. The guidance for materials is now its own section and has been revised to provide a longer list of appropriate and in inappropriate materials. Most of it remains italicized text, which means it can be updated without a formal review process. That is so the commission can easily address whatever new materials might become available in the future. 
Speaking of materials, there is language that increases the allowable maximum reveal for lap siding. By reveal, we mean that portion of lap siding that is exposed once the pieces are lapped. The current practice, which has been in place for several decades, is for all lap siding to have a reveal with a, with a maximum of five inches. There is no record as to how the requirement was initially determined, but it may have been considered an average or a typical reveal. Since historic siding comes in a variety of reveals, staff recommends increasing the maximum to seven inches, as that is a size that is readily available and still within the range of historic reveals. The draft also provides an explanation as to when even wider reveals might be appropriate. The section for demolition was moved to the beginning of the document to emphasize that the review of demolition is the most important role of the commission. The demolition section is fleshed out to reflect, excuse me, to reflect how the commission has applied this section since the beginning of the overlays, specifically partial demolition and non-contributing buildings. The additional language follows the commission's interpretation of this section since the guidelines were first created. For instance, Demolition of non-contributing or non-historic buildings has always met the design guidelines, but th that guidance currently isn't clear. In addition, there is language that would, re that would count removal of historic siding as partial demolition that required review. Currently, replacement siding, windows, doors, and roofing are not reviewed. When all those materials are removed and the interior is completely gutted, the historic building is all but demolished. Siding of all those materials that are not currently reviewed was chosen to be reviewed in this draft since it is a character defining feature and provides some structural stability, which is lost when all other materials are removed. There was discussion previously about not including this review. However, the neighborhood that was most concerned about it is no longer a part of the project. The public and commissioners have spoken for and against this change. So for those reasons, it remains in this current draft. State and local laws, law requires that our design guidelines be based on the National Park Service's Secretary of Interior standards. Those have changed slightly since our guidelines were first created, so that revision is included. We also added some language to ex explain the role of the standards in the design review process. At this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Melissa Baldock. The drawing shown here is currently in all of the neighborhood conservation zoning design guidelines and has been a source of confusion. It is often read as showing the only place where an addition can be constructed, which is not the case. Instead, it is meant to show that if the addition is small enough to fit within the triangular area, then the addition would not need to be reviewed. A related concern is that the text portion of the design guidelines, which attempts to state what is reviewed, it's confusing in that one section states that the design guidelines only apply to areas that are visible from the public right away, and the next sta section states that public facades are more carefully reviewed than others. Since the establishment of the first overlay, the Commission has interpreted these sections and the drawing as a review of all sides of any new construction, but applying a less stringent review on those facades that are not publicly visible. The proposed solution is to remove the image, revise the text, and add a list of actions that would not require review. In terms of additions, guidance for solar panels and skylights has been added, again following how the Commission has looked at these two features in the past. There is new language to stress that additions that are taller and wider are only appropriate if all other solutions have been exhausted and in certain conditions. When the first few additions were approved, it was never the intent to allow all additions to be wider or taller, which is how applicants have interpreted the italicized language. The existing guidelines state that additions could be up to four feet taller if to going taller is the only option. The new guidelines will allow additions to be two feet taller in some instances. Reach raises are something the Commission came up with many years ago that allow for an extra two feet of height on an existing side gable home. However, there wasn't much guidance as to what conditions would warrant such an addition, so that has been added. The requirements that a ridge raise be inset two feet from the side walls and extend no taller than two feet vertical has not changed in the revised guidelines. New language clarifies the difference between a rooftop deck that is above the roof's eaves and an upper level deck. 
The draft states that the rooftop decks are not allowed on historic buildings and provides guidance for including them as part of an addition, if desired. There is language to stress that in terms of new construction, the focus is on form, massing, and scale rather than architectural style. The draft adds clarity for how context will, be, will usually be determined. Context is how the commission determines if a request is what is called appropriate for the district. The context for an addition is the building which the addition is being attached to. Text clarified that it's the existing building's features and form that provide context for additions. So when considering the appropriateness of an addition, the commission is looking solely at the historic house and not what other historic houses in the area may look like. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Sean Alexander. For infill, a new primary building in an existing neighborhood, the context is the immediate surrounding neighborhood. New text clarifies that in most cases, the context for infill will be the block face. Using context far away from a proposed project has been a concern voiced by numerous neighborhoods over multiple years. The commission will retain the ability to define a block face in situations where that is unclear or extend the, expand the context beyond the block face where the immediate context is not considered relevant. The draft provides clarity on how building types relate to zoning. The building types should be consistent with the types in the immediate vicinity, no matter how the lot might be zoned. For instance, let's say the area here is zoned commercial as a hypothetical. Uh, if there were a vacant lot here, the new building might have a commercial use, but its building type would still need to be similar to the residential building type found here. Most guidelines had italicized information for multi-unit development. Again, italicized language is not actual guidelines. So we've removed that language as multi-unit development can result in the encouragement of demolition of historic buildings, alterations and additions that are not appropriate for the historic building, or require infill that is not appropriate for the district. Where multi-unit developments are appropriate, the site is usually so unique that the italicized design guidelines are of little use. Staff recommends addressing each of those requests on a case-by-case -case basis. The language for outbuildings has been rewritten to allow for minimum and maximum sizes, roof slopes, and setbacks for all sites rather than basing the dimensions on the historic building. This could mean that an outbuilding is taller than a principal building if the principal building is short. However, the outbuilding should be set back enough on the lot that the additional height shouldn't be evident from the street. This will allow people to use outbuildings in all the ways they do now that they didn't historically. Outbuildings are no longer just about housing cars and garden equipment, but they also serve as apartments, guest rooms, home offices and studios and playrooms, among other uses where the zoning allow. Specific guidance and dimensions for add-ons, such as the features you see here, is given. This is largely communicated via drawings rather than text alone. We've also added clarification as to how measurements are taken and how setbacks are determined. I'm moving on to part two. Part two is all of the individual chapters for each district, where language specific to each district was collected from the current design guidelines. All of the maps have been revised. The boundaries have not changed, just the graphics of the maps so that they all have a consistent look. Uh, they were originally created at different times. There are very few changes recommended for individual districts. One is to clarify that in the bowling house district, that it, if a two-story building is appropriate, then it should have a hipped roof. This has been a policy, but not officially part of the design guidelines. Um, recently, 
owners, property owners in the Cherokee Park neighborhood asked that stone be included as a potential primary siding material for infill. Currently, the design guidelines only allow for brick. Several years ago, the commission found that rear attached garages could be appropriate because of the lack of rear alley access and other reasons. So that, that guidance has been added as italicized information as well. New short histories have been added to the Greenwood and Maxwell design, uh, Maxwell Heights design guidelines. Uh, this doesn't change any actual design guidelines, just the histories. Uh, and recently, the Greenwood neighborhood has stated that they want all infill to be capped at one and a half stories, so that has been added. In the Lachlan Springs East End design guidelines, there were references to MDHA's design redevelopment district design guidelines for five points to keep an applicant from having to reference the two documents planning a project in that area. This language has been removed uh, because the MDHA redevelopment district has expired. The draft also includes some italicized information that has been followed for about eight years or so already uh, as un well, previously as unitalicized, or it has been corrected to be unitalicized in the new draft. Excuse me. Uh, recently, the Woodlawn neighborhood requested clarification on attached garages, and that has been added. Uh, in summary, staff recommends approval of the September 2019 draft with the changes noted in the attached draft, finding that the project meets section 17.40.410 of the code and of the Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and to have an effective date of May 21st, 2021, which is the day after the May public hearing. Thank you, all the staff. And it is now time for the public to call in if interested in speaking on this uh, consolidation. And that number is 629-255-1911. And Ms. Ziegler, have we received any advanced public comment? Yes, this month you received 21 emails in favor of the project. And of course you have last month's um, emails that were posted on the website last month. And you have all the emails that, and all the meeting notes and so forth that have been a part of the project for the last two and a half years. And I think we may have a caller. So just give us just a minute on that. And, Hello, this is Carol Ashworth. I live at 919 Carruthers Avenue. I'm calling to represent the 12th South Neighborhood Association, which is partially under the Waverly Belmont Conservation Overlay. We support the consolidation of neighborhood conservation zoning overlay, and we appreciate all the hard work done by Ms. Ziegler and her staff to bring this to completion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ashworth. And Councilman Brett Withers? There's another call. Okay, um, Councilman, we have another call and I will catch you there at the uh, another, at the next. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. This is Carrie Conley. I'm at 2405 10th Avenue South. 
Um, 37204, I'm in the Waverly Belmont Conservation Zoning Overlay. I was one of the leads for the overlay. Um, and I am calling in support of the consolidation guidelines. I think that there are so many benefits from not only protecting our historic homes. We work so hard and it has been frustrating to see some of the developers basically take everything to the point that the, the house is structurally unsound. And so there's basically nothing left, which is not why we wanted, we wanted to protect and preserve our historic homes as much as we could without restricting the residents and the homeowners too much from being able to add on. Um, I also think that the raised height initiative is great for us that are in one story historic homes, um, as well as the bad additions. So I think that there are way more positives and would be a huge benefit for not only Waverly Belmont overlay, but all the others, as well as helping the work overload with the Metro Historic Commission. So once again, I um, fully support the consolidation guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Conley. Do we have any other call-ins? Okay, not at this time. All right, um, Councilman Withers. Uh, thank you so much, Chair, for recognizing me. Just wanted to chime in on uh, a couple of items. Uh, you probably have emails as well, but uh, obviously the commission has very frequently run into issues where folks put up siding and think it's fine and realize that it's not. Um, I think that having the a little bit more flexibility for siding options uh, will benefit homeowners, uh, frankly, um, uh, who uh, either have a different sort of aesthetic design or in some cases their houses originally had wider siding. I think that that is flexibility that uh, will be very beneficial to neighbor neighborhoods uh, and homeowners. Also for the removal of siding, you know, it, it's unfortunate that we uh, just here in District 6, I would say maybe once a year about um, we have a building where someone has removed all the siding and then the house collapses. And then one of those just happened about a month ago. So the removal of all of the siding definitely is a problem that leads to buildings either being exposed to the elements and decaying or outright collapsing. And I think having some degree of re review of that is beneficial. The uh, added flexibility a little bit for the outbuildings, I think one of the other callers mentioned, that will be beneficial for homeowners who have like your single story historic houses. They can have a little bit more room. We obviously had robust discussion with a lot of the builder community and neighborhoods about the uh, design guideline pattern book for outbuildings. And that got a little bit more complicated than maybe uh, uh, we had initially anticipated. But I think that the this is a, a good compromise gives owners of smaller homes a little bit more room, but also leaves it up to the commission to review to make sure that the setbacks are appropriate so that it's not overpowering the house. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is for the Lachlan Springs East End conservation overlay, staff have referenced that the Five Points Redevelopment District has expired. Uh, you've got an application on, on the agenda later today. That's something that, that I'm probably going to still reference uh, to the commission, sometimes at least as historical background. And in particular, I, I would hope that the commission would consider that for cases in which someone was working on with staff on a, on a project at the time that the redevelopment district expired, or in some cases we've had um, structures that were destroyed by the tornado. And, and I don't want to sort of adversely affect those, those property owners by the expiration of that. Uh, redevelopment district. I think that that time will end when that will be applicable, but would just ask to uh, that the commission would keep an open mind. I'll be happy to uh, cite some of that information in those those few specific cases. I think it, it would only be a very few cases, um, but I think otherwise removing that from the conservation overlay design guidelines is appropriate because it used to be a little confusing. So those are my comments for this and just uh, again want to thank all the staff for their work. Thank you, Councilman Withers. We appreciate your support and also always your um, very articulate um, observations of your specific district as well. I um, do not see any other hands uh, raised from the other public other than our commissioners. So we will um, take this to the commissioner discussion. Okay. 
Commissioners, you have the floor. Commissioner Mayhall. Well, I just wanted to, to thank the uh, Robin and, and the whole team for all the hard work they've done to put in put into all this. They had no more than they had probably 15 meetings, public meetings of of some sort in 2019, and they have just been over backwards to with all these neighborhoods that wanted to tweak it a little bit different. And 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 I just I tell you, if it, every metro department ran like like this, I would give them all an A plus. And so I just wanted to voice my support for the conservation overlay. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bell. Um, well, I will echo Commissioner Mayho uh, for all the effort by staff, as well as community members. Uh, it is a huge task to undertake and the end result uh, appear to be, uh, you know, everybody can be proud of. Uh, on that note, uh, I do have a little bit a uh, question or rather clarification to the staff. Uh, I understand uh, several neighborhood association are currently uh, opt out of the consolidation. So um, I'm thinking existing guidelines still remains on those individual uh, neighborhood associations currently opt out of the consolidation uh, policy or guidelines. However, you know, existing guideline applies. In that token, I think existing guideline is somewhat unclear and somewhat what uh, encourage like a skeleton type of uh, rehabilitation, such as removing windows, removing siding, and so forth. And, you know, as a result of building being collapsed. So is there any kind of uh, risk associated with those uh, currently opted out a neighborhood? Uh, if staff can uh, comment on that, uh, that would be great. Hi, this is Robin Ziegler. Uh, yes, those three districts will continue to use their existing design guidelines. And as we have, uh, you know, pointed out all the different reasons for the different changes or tweaks and revisions that are proposed, um, we do feel like that puts those neighborhoods at risk. So they will continue to have that risk and that confusion. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, that was uh, my concern because sometimes, you know, consolidating document and, you know, uh, going through each language and compare a uh, current uh, document uh, versus a consolidated document. It's a lots of time consuming task. And, you know, some uh, might be uh, kind of not clear, you know, the clear difference is. So, um, so if that kind of happen, hopefully we can have some kind of remedy, you know, as far as we as a, a department kind of keep, keep an eye on the new or building remodeling and kind of catch before collapse or, you know, result being demolition, unintended demolition happens. So that would be my hope as well. And also at the same different token, uh, you know, sometimes when we, with good intention, but sometimes we find uh, like unintended consequences. So if that happened, if we have to tweak out in the future to further clarify the a guideline, uh, as a commissioners and commission, do we have uh, capability to further clarify if and when those uh, unintended consequences happen? So that would be another question to the staff. This is Robin Ziegler. Yes, that's a that's a really good question as well, because um, no doubt that there will be. There's no way to know exactly how things will work or or what things will come up that we didn't anticipate. Um, so there are guidelines to so to a certain extent you can certainly continue to interpret them and change that interpretation over time. So it'll really just depend on the language of the guidelines and the issue at hand as to how far you can go. 
but then we can also work with neighborhoods individually or as a group again to revise guidelines. Thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Thank you. Very good discussion. And this is Chair Bell. In in um, following up to that, when the question of those uh, conservation over um, the commu communities or associations that have opted out, um, Ms. Ziegler, would they in the future have the option to opt in? Yes, sorry about that. This is Robin Ziegler. Yes, they could opt in at a later date. Okay. Okay. And I'll just add to that. They would also, like all the others, have their own chapter and so could put information into that chapter that may be specific to them. Okay. Thank you. Other commissioners? Commissioner Jones? Uh, yes, just wanted to share the when the meetings were being held um, over a year ago, I um, was a designee for the commission to attend several of those meetings. Um, so, and you know, during that time, I did see the that was again very, you know draft one at that top point in time. Um, but the comments taken by community members that attended, um, you know, and in, put into the document, and then. You know everything kind of just getting hashed out in real time in these meetings um so i just um wanted to share that you know those things as we've said of all the meetings that that did occur um you know i i was in several of them and um it's just very impressive that everything that that went on and i think this final you know draft of the documents um, is definitely something that i am in support of okay thank you commissioner commissioner fitz Yes, I um, also wanted to express my full support of this um, final draft of the documents. Uh, just as Commissioner Jones said, um, there have been countless comments from the public and then also from us, from the commission. And um, it's great to have seen those comments included in this draft. I think the pandemic has given us even longer to sit with it. and. Um, and I just uh, wanted to express my support of that. Also, um, I'm not sure if this is the right time to make this comment or not, but I've seen lots of uh, new Instagram and Facebook groups popping up, kind of expressing dismay of, of historic structures being torn down. And I think it's important to educate the public maybe at this moment about how these overlays get established and how they really start at the kind of ground grassroots level. Um, if you're concerned about the, the buildings in your neighborhood, you need to get, get organized with your neighborhood associations and propose an overlay. If you don't have a neighborhood association and you're concerned, you need to, you need to form, form a neighborhood association with your neighbors. And when you've come to us and present that that you would like to establish an overlay for your neighborhood, that's how that's how we end up seeing it. And also just wanted to point out with the Haynes Height neighborhood we saw a couple of months ago, it does not have to be limited, um, you know, just to, to early to mid 1900s homes. We've got, um, it's more of a mid-century neighborhood. And so there's that option too. So I just wanted to, um, make that statement. I don't know, uh, Commissioner Bell, you may have something else you want to add to that or, or Ms. Sigler. Well said, Commissioner. I'm just, we're, we're all making some really good recommendations and comments and it is a good time to, this is Chair Bell, um, to have this broader uh, conversation so that the public can be more aware any other commissioners? Uh, Ms. Ziegler, did you? Yes, I, if you don't mind, I, and not to repeat what Commissioner Fitz has already said, but I really did want to stress it because that's such a good point. 
And I was just talking to a neighborhood leader who brought that up as well, that we need better education about how this works. Because I think that people do assume it is something that we, the commissioners and staff, create. All of these existing overlays came about because of the neighborhoods. They came to us and asked for us to provide information for them to consider, and they did all the work to make them happen. So it's not something that's imposed on neighborhoods. It is something that they actively create and generate on their own. And it is the only option uh, Metro has to prevent demolition of historic properties. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Ziegler. Other commissioners? Because this is, um, this is Chair Bell again, and we've heard from um, three commissioners now, four commissioners, but I really would like to have comment from the rest because this is a, this is a significant change to our um, guidelines and the way we move in our commission. So I would really like to hear from the rest of you. Commissioner Price. Sure, I'll take the bait. Thank you, Chair Bill. Uh, <laughs> I want to, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'd like to echo the positive comments for this design guideline consolidation effort that, that have already been mentioned by uh, the other commissioners. I think the staff has done a tremendous job uh, with the public hearings and comments and um, distributing comments and information to us and the, the many informational meetings that we've had as a, as a commission together. Uh, it's all been a, a very good, transparent, um, process that I think will make all of our jobs um, not only streamlined, but things will just make uh, better sense where where before there might have been contradictions and, and things that weren't clear that now will be. Uh, I also am very supportive of the change to add review to the removal of historic siding. I live just down the street and around the corner from the house that collapsed in a windstorm uh, a month or so ago. Um, and that, that building, that house was a, a historic home that absolutely could have been renovated uh, had, had that siding not been removed. So it's, it's something that I'm uh, very supportive of and I'm, I'm glad to see it and uh, the other changes as well. So thanks to Robin, thanks to all the staff. You, you guys did a great job and uh, I look forward to voting in favor of it today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I have two other commissioners. Thank you, Commissioner Mosley. Thank you, Chair Bell. Yeah, um, certainly it's been um, quite a bit of time to have this open for public discussion. There's been quite, quite a bit of movement from what was originally proposed and to what sits before us today. So I think I applaud both the community and the staff for sticking to this and, and that the purpose behind it, while, while each application is you know, is to be considered of its own merits, this certainly makes the overall regulation for us as commissioners and, and for the staff um, a little, little more easily applied and consistently applied. That is the uh, intent, and I think the, these do a good job of moving us towards that. Certainly not a panacea. It won't solve all our problems or make every review um, easy, but I think there's no set of guidelines that would do that. And um, those are my comments. Again, I applaud the staff for their efforts in the community for being involved and caring about what happens in our historic districts. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Williams. Um, yes, I'm still relatively new on the um, commission, so I didn't get an opportunity to um, see this, this process unfold. But I, I can speak to the fact that I am um, very impressed with the work that staff has done, and I am encouraged by the um, the commitment to the preservation of historic homes that um, that has been reflected in the comment and the report that I see today. So I am very happy with what I have read and what I have heard, and I applaud staff for their diligent work. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I echo, uh, this is Chair Bell again, I echo all the Commissioner's comments and I think it's all been well said. 
and I will entertain a, a vote, a motion, and a vote if there are no other discussions. This is Commissioner Williams. I, um, I make a motion to approve. Commissioner Williams, can you just, um, just for more clarity, um, your motion would be to approve the design guide design, design consolidation? Okay, okay. Um, I make a motion to approve the design guide uh, um, consolidation. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. And is there a second? And Commissioner Mosley, I believe I'm gonna Acknowledge your hand raised. I left it up from before, but I will second that motion. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, all right, there is a motion on the floor and there is a first and a second and I will call on the commissioners. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, very well. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. <laughs> and we will, um, yes, that'll, that'll give our commission more guidance and as well, so we will now move on to our, I believe our first case. Um, however, I will say this now is the time for anyone to call um, on, from the public um, regarding the historic landmark overlay at 606 8th Avenue South. And that number is 629-255-1911. And Ms. Baldock will be our presenter. I will present the next two cases together as the applicant is the same and they are part of the same development project. The applicant requests historic landmark zoning overlays for 606 8th Avenue South, the GP Rose G&S Distributing Company building, which you may know as a downtown antique mall, and 700 8th Avenue South, which is was the John Deere Plow Company building and most recently was the Voorhees building. By working these two buildings as part of a larger campus type development that will include new construction around the buildings. 606 8th Avenue South was constructed between 1946 and 1945 and 1946 as a warehouse for the G&S Distributing Company. Although parts of the structure may date to the 1880s when it served as a grain warehouse for GP Rose Grain Company. Right after the war, end of World War II, it was used for many post-government and veteran services. Post-war government and veteran services. 700 8th Avenue South dates to 1937 and represents a part of Nashville's commercial history and the region's agricultural history. Constructed for the John Deere Plow Company, the building embodies the architectural qualities and construction techniques of functional commercial and industrial structures of the 1930s. It is significant for its architecture and association with the John Deere Company, one that has had decades long impact on farming, farming techniques nationwide. Staff suggests that the commission recommend approval of um, 606 8th Avenue South as a historic landmark, uh, finding that the area to meet criteria one and three of section 17.36-120. Uh, um, staff recommends the adoption of the existing historic landmark guidelines to apply to this property finding that they are consistent with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Okay. And I think I might have read, it says on the screen, um, I think I might have read out just 606 8th Avenue South, but it should be both 606 and 700 8th Avenue South. So sorry about that. Okay, it's both those, both those um, addresses. Um, do we have an applicant on this proposal, Ms. Ziegler? Or Ms. Baldock? Hey, this is Ryan Terrell. I apologize. Uh, this is Ryan Terrell. Um, I was part of the application team for this project. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Terrell. You have the floor. 
Oh, um, I was actually going to come in, Melissa, for the, the summary and uh, giving us some history here on these two buildings. Um, I have nothing else to add at this moment. Okay. We thank you for for bringing this to our um, agenda today. And um, and and again, your, your group, you were representing the applicant again? That is correct. Okay. All right. Um, do we have any call-ins from the public? Okay. No, no call-ins. And commissioners, do you have any questions or comments regarding this uh, designation? And Commissioner Mosley. Commissioner Bell, uh, or Chair Bell, wanted to just state for the record that um, this case was presented to the um, um, Downtown Code Design Review Committee, uh, of which I'm a member and I represent the Historic Zone Commission on that, um, on a design review board. So I've seen the, this application previously and certainly that uh, just as a matter, a matter of record, wanted to point that out. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. And we appreciate your service on that. Any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Fitz. I just wanted to um, applaud the, the applicant for submitting these projects for historic landmark status. Um, it's a it's a great option when when you have a building that doesn't fall within a specifically historic district. And I always love seeing these come through um, because I, as a native Nashvilleian, have seen so many of these buildings, but haven't always known their history. And I love just learning about the history of them. So um, I'm in support of this project. And if if no one else, um, if no other commissioners. Yeah, if no other commissioner. Yeah, oh, just Commissioner Bell here. I, okay. I did not close public hearing, but I will close it now. For, Sorry. For the finality. No, that, that was on me and I apologize for the interruption, but I, I just remembered I did not close public hearing. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Fitch, uh, please, please, please move forward. Uh, Commissioner Price has his hands up. I was going to make a motion, but I'll let okay. Commissioner Price speak. All right, Commissioner Price. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just have a quick question. I, I, I think this is a great application too. I do have a question though. I was struck by the before. I mean, I, I've, I've known the Voorhees building since I've lived in Nashville, and even before then, I remember visiting Eighth Avenue, doing some shopping at, at the Antiques Mall. I, I just, I'm just struck by the, the the new windows and how different it is. I mean, we, we talk a lot about character defining features of buildings, especially for landmarks. And I just wonder, maybe this is a question for staff. I mean, I don't dislike all the new windows. I think it looks great, but is that something we would have reviewed under the landmark ordinance had it been in place before the renovation? Um, Hi, this is Robin Ziegler. Yes, certainly it would be something that would, would, would have been reviewed, but as you pointed out, it was done prior. And yeah. it's kind of a tricky situation because it is a warehouse building. It had almost no windows to begin with, and it, it needs a new life, needs a new use, and how do you accomplish that without windows? Um, right. Especially for the type of development that they're doing, which obviously is not just another warehouse, but it is... A, a large campus development, multi-use, uh, residential, commercial. Um, I think it'll be pretty exciting. It looks great on paper. So yes, uh, would have been reviewed, maybe not ideal, but it is still keeping that same general type of opening, those concrete panels between the brick. So the right. same kind of rhythm of design is still there. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to kind of point that out and, and ask about it just for future reference, I guess. So thank you. Yes. Thank you for clarification. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mosley, did you have a comment? You, you had uh, it was it was answered by staff. I, I was just gonna add a little bit of color to that since the um, public hearing is, is closed, but I, I think it was um, appropriately addressed. Okay. Well, of course, we're, we're still under discussion, so um, that would have been totally fine. So you, you can actually add more color if you like. <laughs> um, so
So we have another dis any other discussions, commissioners? Otherwise, I believe Commissioner Fitz was going to make a motion. Okay, I don't see uh, Commissioner Mayhall may be getting ready to ask a question. Oh, you, you uh, sorry? Yes, there you are. Sorry, sorry. I I, I didn't know my hand was raised. I'm, I don't have any comment. Okay. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Fitz, let's try that one more time. All right, with regards to uh, both six, it's 606 and 700 8th Avenue South, um, I would like to make a motion to approve the applications for historic landmarks. Okay, and we're recommending that, correct? And does that go to the council? This is Robin Ziegler. Yes, this is a new overlay. So unlike the guidelines, this is creating a new overlay. So our recommendation is to council to approve it. They'll make the final decision and to adopt the existing guidelines for landmarks to apply to these two new landmarks as well. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And Commissioner Mosley. Uh, I'll second the clarified motion to recommend uh, approval to the council of both the landmark status and the guidelines. Okay, thank you. And I will take the roll. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. That That is a very good um, recommendation for us to bring to the council. And again, it is a very good project and we appreciate the applicant as well. Now is the time for anyone to call if they have public comment regarding the SP review for 945 South Douglas Unit 4. And the number is 629-255-1911. And Ms. Warren will be our presenter. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good in, afternoon. 2000, <laughs> in 2018, <laughs> the commission approved an SP for the site at 945 South Douglas. 19 houses are planned for the development. The commission approved specific ridge and eave heights and widths for each unit and recommended approval to the planning commission. The SP was approved. The applicant is returning to this commission for final design approval of each unit. You have already approved units one through three and today we will look at unit four. This unit was approved at one and a half stories with a maximum ridge height of 35 feet and an eave height of 12 feet. The width here was approved at 40 feet. As designed, the ridge height is about 33 feet, the eaves are just below 12 feet, and the width matches the 40-foot limit. The proposed height meets all of the parameters. Staff finds that the proposal is appropriate in terms of height, massing, materials, and roof form. It is consistent with the site plan approved for the SP, and there are no design issues. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed house with standard conditions as seen here. I believe the applicant is present um, and they have agreed to the conditions, but he might like to speak. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Will the applicant like to speak? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Martin Wick. Uh, I'm at 912 Bailey Street. Um, and I just wanted to uh, thank staff for working with us on this. Um, I think as we're moving down the street here, we're kind of getting the hang of, of everything and, and getting these kind of in line with what, what staff is looking for. Um, and we're just gonna kind of keep moving. Okay, thank you, Mr. Applicant. And do we have any public comment? No call in? Okay, thank you, we have no call in. And so we will close public hearing. And commissioners? Mr. Price. <laughs> Yes, if there's no other uh, questions or comments from the commission, I would move for approval of okay. the staff recommendation. All right. There's a motion, and if there is a second, and then we can discuss if we need to. Uh, Commissioner Mayhall. 
I second that motion. Okay. Was there any other discussion from other commissioners? Okay, seeing none raised, there's a motion on for us to call the roll. And that would be, um, check and see if the vice chair is in. Okay, all right. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now is the time for anyone to call uh, regarding 726 McFerrin? And the number is 629-255-1911. And Ms. Warren will be our presenter. Okay, this is an application for a revision to a previously approved infill project in Maxwell Heights. The commission approved this project in January of 2021. Typically, staff can administratively approve small revisions to projects that the commission has approved. However, this revision involves increasing the massing of the proposed mixed use structure in a sensitive area where it was stepping down in height and stepping back away from the street in an effort to transition to the lower scaled residential area next door. Because the adjacent historic context along with Karen Avenue is one and one and a half story houses with pitched roofs, staff had requested that the height of the development taper down to one story as it approaches this context. The design was approved as such with some tapering of both height and inset from the street. You can see here how the two-story flat roof design steps down and back to transition toward the height setbacks and massing of the one and one and a half story houses with pitched roofs along the street. These design elements were very carefully negotiated with the applicant in an attempt to help ease the overall height and massing transition. The applicant is now requesting to pull the second story massing closer to the residential context and to pull it forward closer to the street. This will increase the width of that second story central bay by about three feet. It will decrease the width of the one story section from about seven feet to about four feet, and it will decrease the inset of the second story section. Here you can see how the second story massing will be pulled forward by about two feet. And here are the changes in plan. These adjustments of two and three feet might sound minor overall on a project of this size, but in this sensitive location, these few feet represent the loss of nearly half of the inset that was provided on the side and about a third of the recess from the street. Staff recommends disapproval of the request requested massing revisions, finding that the revisions did not meet sections 2B1A and B of the design guidelines for Maxwell Heights Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay for height and scale. I know that uh, Mr. Williams is here and would like to speak. Okay, thank you, Ms. Warren. And applicant, you have the floor. Yeah, hello, um, this is Brandon Williams speaking. Um, just really, you know, the two or three feet, you know, it's really just a minor change. Again, we didn't change the height or the width. Um, just really wanted to make the units more livable and accessible. Uh, really wanted to put, you know, long-term units in there. I mean, from a historic context, you know, I, I don't think you could really tell exterior any the difference of the two of what was approved versus what we're approving um, as we were getting to the design um, we determined that you know we need to make a few tweaks and minor tweaks just to make it more a uh, livable space um, also you know the the unit next door is I know we originally we, we tried to put a driveway down there if you if you you know look at our, our previous uh, submittals um and the commission asked the request that we be close to the homes in which we did we still do have those step backs imposed um so not really made any difference in that so that we still have that that drawback on the second floor the width still remains the same the height remains the same um from a neighborhood i don't think we're, we're making a big change from historic context especially with this big development um, just wanted to make it more livable, use, useful space um, for more affordable housing on the second floor. Um, and really, that, that's really all that we have. I mean, we're, we're very appreciative of what was originally approved, um, but we do want to make it more usable space on the second floor. 
Um, I think we only, you know, reduced the patio and on the side, maybe two, three feet. Um, it's just the most as we went. So very minor tweak as we were getting into the details and the design. Uh, we wanted to to make it more a usable use, usable space, um, you know, for for you know whoever you know would would live in in those units. So um, that that's really all that we have. I mean, very appreciative of what we have, but I uh, wanted to make it more you know long term, um, you know, rental units for you know the occupancies. Um, versus, you know, short term. So that's that's what would make us do that. I know next door adjacent is is a commercial space as well. I know it looks like a home, a pitch roof, but um, those are, are short term rentals as well. Um, so I don't I don't think we would be really a deterrent to the from a historic context. Um, but that's all I have, and, and thank you for for taking the time to uh, to review the application. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Do we have any public comments? Any call ins? No calls. Okay, neither. So I will close public hearing. And commissioners, do you have any questions to our staff or other discussion? Um, yeah. Jenny, could could you put the the differences of the prior and the current. Thank you. Any questions from the commission for, for the applicant? Mr. Or? Williams, Mr. Williams, okay. we, we have closed public hearing, so okay. please, please let the commissioners discuss and they may come back to you, but please hold your comment. Commissioner Fitz? All right, I'll go ahead and start discussion. Um, I really did like the the solution that was presented prior, and I did like how it was stepping down to acknowledge the um, the shorter one story form adjacent to it. Uh, I realized that the new submission has um, bumped out a bit uh, in this in this image to the left, and then out out towards us. I do think that the the new revision while it may not step back as far um, in both directions, I do still think it accomplishes, um, I still think it, it accomplishes that step down effect. And while it is still several feet in both directions, um, I, I still think the, I think the revision accomplishes the in, intended purpose and would like to hear from the other commissioners. Thank you, Commissioner. Jenny, can you also put in the one where it has the the um, dimensions on the, yep, the, um, there was a flat, more floor plan, seeing it from the top. Um, that might be helpful. Anyway. We'll see if the commissioners. I think it's one more, Melissa. Sorry, there's a floor uh, uh, roof plan right at the end. Yeah, roof plan. Thank there you. you. There you go. Roof plan, right? That way we can see where it's stepping forward. Commissioners, mm -hmm. Commissioner Mayhall. Well, looking at these these drawings, I tend to agree with Commissioner Fitz. I don't think it's that big of a change, but that's just, I'd be interested in hearing what other commissioners uh, think about it. Right. Um, I think Chair, Chair Bell here. Um, Jenny, could, could you just give us one more 
run through on the recommendation from staff so that we're clear the reasoning behind that. Sure. Melissa, do you mind bumping back to the, the two elevations? There we go. There we go. Thank you. So our feeling, we had worked with the applicant quite a bit over months. I think you guys might remember they first came to you with just this McFerrin piece, and then they later came back with the whole um, the whole development, which kind of wraps the corner there. Um, so we'd worked with them for quite a while. Um, and this, this was consistently one of the things that we really were working hard on to make sure that we had a step down here, both in terms of height and setback to help transition that it's a tall, um, if you see the full development, uh, maybe we'll take like a bump back to the, the first slide. Um, it's a large, massive um, development, and we're just really trying to ease that transition into the more residential context. Um, so we had really worked hard on this corner, um, getting, to, getting it to a place where we had that one-story section, and then we have, um, even when it becomes two-story, that two-story section is at first recessed, um, and, and then it pulls forward towards the street. Um, so when when they came to us and asked to change the massing there, we just felt like that was a really sensitive part of the project, and we didn't feel comfortable approving those changes without bringing it back to you. Okay, thank you again for that clarification. Commissioner Price. Yeah, um, I, uh, I I tend to side with staff on this. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the sensitivity to surrounding residential um building types, houses. Uh, I know there's a, there's a case later on the agenda that this is gonna be an issue also. And I think it's important for us as a commission to be sensitive when, when on these transitional lots, uh, co corner commercial lots, when they, when they butt right up next to historic homes. Uh, I, I appreciate the work that they did that Jenny just mentioned on the front end, working with the, the designer and the developer I think it was a good solution, and my preference would be to to stay um, with the previously approved plans. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bell. Um, I remember a discussion uh, because this is a transition, and you know, right next to the residential zoning. And I remember especially praising uh, the applicant working with the staff to make a nice transition because this size of the mass is quite a big change, but especially the corner right next to the uh, typical residential uh, structure, it has really nice, uh, even though it's big, but it has intention and nice transition. So, you know, having those uh, intention and transition, and then it comes to final, uh, stage and can increase even though it may be two feet, three feet in each uh, section, but it appearance, to me, appearance uh, will be a bit overwhelming because that smooth transition was our intent. So I was seeing a bit disappointed to kind of bumping up in both directions. So maybe in, you know, as a compromise, I don't know if it's possible, but having that section in this uh, right next to the residential section and same as previously approved, and then towards mid-section, maybe, you know, might be able to bump up some, but entirely bump up the second roof right next to the residential zoning, to me, it's just uh, give me kind of bad taste. So I'm uh, in uh, in line with the uh, staff recommendation with this uh, project. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mosley. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair Bell. So as I recall this case, um, there's two different lots and, and they're not necessarily consolidated. This, this will exist kind of on its own. The architecture speaks to that in that there's a, you know, there's something that's rather significant in terms of lot coverage that meets the corner um, that 
not inappropriate necessarily. And then this additional lot is kind of tacked onto it with the opportunity to transition to the more residential form. And that's how the project was originally presented. And and I think that now coming back and, and you know, further maximizing second floor area, we'll understand that from livability and from the sake of return on investment. Um, I get those things, but I, I, I tend to um, appreciate the effort that went into the first submission and that as, a, as looking at the project as a whole and its appropriateness, um, I, I feel like the original submission is meets those desires with a lot of work to this point, and I'm, I'm just inclined to um, allow a further pushing towards the side and the front to, to, to maximize more, more space, more enclosed space, and um, those are my, my thoughts. Duly noted, Commissioner. Any other comments? And I do welcome Vice Chair Stewart to the meeting. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Jones. Yes, um, just after reviewing, you know, our packet and the photos and while it isn't, you know, in general, if you just think of, you know, a couple feet of change, I do think that it changes, you know, the look and feel and, and I just echo everything that both, you know, Commissioner Johnson and Mosley said that I, you know, if this is a new build, we're not working with any, you know, we're trying to, we're not trying to work around in, uh, any existing conditions. Um, so I just think the, f the further maximizing of, of this, you know, two story structure that's already next to a one story residence um, is just a little too much. So I'm, I'm in agreement with staff on this one as well. Okay. Duly noted again, Commissioner. Any other comments? Recommendations? Okay. Um, are we ready to entertain a motion? Commissioner Mayhall? Yes, um, I appreciate the discussion from all the commissioners. This is a, a tough case, and um, but I, I, I have to change my, my, my recommendation. And I recommend that we approve the staff recommendation for 726 McFerrin Avenue. Okay, I thank you. And there is a motion. Is there a second? Commissioner Mosley? Um, I think uh, Commissioner Johnson was uh, to the gun, oh, I wouldn't really. I'm sorry. Necessarily wanted to make the second, other than, uh, and I, I fully think that Commissioner Mayhall was understood, but um, wanted to clarify that the staff recommendations for disapproval of the application. Okay. Yeah, I think our name sort of changed on the line there. So our, let me just say that. Yes, you are seconding the motion, Commissioner. I, yes, I, I can okay. second the motion. I just wanted to clarify that the staff's recommendations for disapproval of the application of 726 was Right, right. Duly noted. Um, okay, so there's the first and the second to approve the re recommendation of disapproval by the staff. So I will call the roll. Yes or no, Vice Chair Stewart. Unless you would want to, I don't know if you abstain because you just came through on the middle of the conversation. Yes. Okay. We, we're Vice Chair. I, I think um, I get a nod that because you are in the middle of that, we will we will get you on the next one. All right, um, Commissioner Fitz. No. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. Oh, I'm not. I'm not going to miss Commissioner Johnson. I'm sorry, it was not on my list again. I'm sorry. Let me say Commissioner Price one more time. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. And Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, and the motion passes. Now is the time for anyone to call if they have uh, public comment in regarding 
Um, where are we here? Violation? 1408B Bosco. Right, okay, thank you. There we go. All right, uh, 1408B Bosco Street, and that number is 629 255 1911. And Mr. Hoffman will be our presenter. Yes, good afternoon. 1408 Bosco, uh, 1408B Bosco Street is a rear deck carport encroaching into the 20 foot rear setback built without a permit. The deck itself, the materials and design does not require uh, commission review as it is a rear addition that cannot be seen from the street and is located within the triangular area shown in the design guidelines as not requiring a permit. A permit from the codes department is required. As constructed, the deck intrudes into the 20 foot rear setback by 10 feet. In an historic overlay, it is the MHZC that makes the setback determinations. The commission's ability to reduce setbacks is so that it can easily address historic conditions. This property has no existing historic conditions. A similar request uh, up the hill at 1406 Boscobel Street was denied in August of 2020. Staff uh, does not find a compelling reason for the deck to be allowed within the setback and finds that the proposal does not meet section 2B3 of the design guidelines. Staff therefore recommends disapproval of the setback determination and finds that the deck does not meet section 2B3 of the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Design Guidelines. Staff recommends that the unpermitted structure be removed within 60 days of the commission's decision. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Applicant, if you are on the line, you are welcome to speak. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, and please announce yourself on your yes. name. Yes, uh, I'm James Dunn, I'm the owner of the property, and um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to present. Uh, I submitted a fairly extensive document um, outlining sort of the context of the decision making we made and sort of rationale why uh, we hope that the deck is approved as is. Um, I think if you look at pages um, four to six of the document I prepared, uh, we made a very intentional effort to uh, reflect the dimensions and setbacks of the neighboring structures. I think in particular, if you look at the uh, photograph that is on page um, six of the document, uh, you'll see that you know we really, really try to stay within the same dimensions. And quite frankly, I was very confused um, by the staff's contention that it intruded 10 feet into the 20 foot setback. Um, I actually went over out this weekend and, and measured from the edges of the other structures that are, there's three other um, commission approved uh, structures that are on the lot in that picture. Uh, I measured those from the edge of their uh, dimensions to the uh, 20 foot mark. And it appears that the um, 20 foot setback is being measured from the center of the alley on all three of them. Uh, when I measure from the alley center to uh, my, my deck, it appears that we're only about like two, two and a half feet into the overlay, not 10 feet. And I'm certainly willing to consider, you know, shortening the deck to that 20 foot length. Um, but I do believe that there's some, some reasons to consider leaving the deck as it fully is. I think in the decision that was cited for 1406 um, Basketball Street, one of the notes that was made on that page is that there was some confusion about whether, or conflicting information about whether or not the, the deck ordinances for, you know, deck ordinances are allowing the decks to be built within 10 feet of the property line actually applies in this case um, because that particular project needed to be expedited because the deck on that home had been hit by a truck and it was hanging off the house. Um, they, they expedited the process, so they didn't go all the way through to the zoning examiner according to the, um, the staff's recommendation. I would like to exhaust that process before we um, agree to have to have my deck either removed or shortened. Um, I also would suggest that we, we, we look at the intent of the historic codes against the as-built reality of our alley. Um, if I look at most 20-foot setbacks and most uh, neighbor uh, blocks around us, um, there those it encompasses yards, backyards, outbuildings, things like that. It's, it's something uh, where people sort of work and play. Um, I think if you look at page seven of the document that I provided, um, the 20 set foot setback on our block because of the number of uh, duplexes that have been built is dedicated to parking. There's 15 parking pads, either driveways or, or parking pads like ours that stretch from basically our home all the way up to 14th Street. Um, so therefore I suggest that there's actually kind of a compelling reason to allow this deck and other types of projects like that because it softens the severity of the, uh, the alleyway back there. 
and actually provides more of a living space that's actually used. Um, I think that's a better case that's more representative of the historical use of that than anything else. I think if you also look at um, um, some of the pictures that you've had, if you look at the alley, um, this is a very new block overall. I think there's probably two contributing homes in the entire block. Um, in addition to the three duplexes that you're seeing there up the street, um, everything on the Shelby Avenue side was constructed probably in the last four or five years. That was an uh, infill area. So this is a very new block and nobody can really see anywhere uh, onto this deck. I think as far as allowing um, consideration for sort of a special consideration, I do know that at looking at the uh, additional dwelling unit that was built at 1410 Boscobel Street, uh, in the notes on that recommendation for the commission's approval, they, they noted that the lots on our side of the street are 25 feet shorter um, than lots in the typical neighborhood. And so they allow the um, additional dwelling unit to be built just 12 feet from the principal house versus 20 feet. Um, and finally, I've included a, a petition from our neighbors. Um, the deck has been received very well from our neighbors. They, they, they tell us that they prefer looking at it than just the, the parking pad. They feel like it's a good addition to the neighborhood. So I would really appreciate um, the opportunity to have this be kept as is. Um, and again, I'm willing to shorten it by the two feet but I, I do not believe that the deck, the 10 feet of it needs to be removed to be compliant. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dunn. Do we have any public comment? We have received, or you have received four emails in favor of the project, and I do not believe there are any callers. Okay, so we will close public hearing. And commissioners, questions, comments, Commissioner Mosley? Uh, it's just a, a clarification of my understanding. I'm certainly not an expert in this and exactly how um, zoning administrator would measure. Uh, I know some some setbacks, especially front setbacks, um, are influenced by center line of the street, but I understand that side and rear setbacks are measured from the property line and oftentimes the edge of the alley is indeed not the property line. Can the staff provide clarity on them? Commissioner, I'm sorry, this is Paul. Could you repeat your question? Uh, sure. The um, I, I feel like if, if I'm if I'm understand the history correct that often the front setbacks can be measured from Central Island Street. Uh, there, there are some regulation, regulatory um, items that are measured in the front from center lines as opposed to from property lines. But, but my understanding uh, and how we've operated in the past is that side and rear setbacks are measured from the property line, not necessarily from the center line of the alley. And additionally, that um, oftentimes the edge of the alley, you, you can need a survey to determine that the edge of the alley is oftentimes not the uh, edge of the public right line or the pro that's, rear property line in this case. Yes, that, that's certainly the case. Uh, alleyways can be difficult to, uh, to determine that. Really, only a survey can, uh, can accurately reflect those rear property lines. From the property line. That's correct. Mr. Mosley, was that sufficient? Uh, I, indeed, it was. I, I think it clarifies maybe both for the applicant and for for commissioners in, in terms of. You know, in, in the one case, I think the applicant proposed that it was two and a half feet in, in uh, a violation, and, and I think it potentially is if the um, if there were the need to bring it into compliance, if that's how the commission finds, it would be not measured from from the center line, but but it would be a more significant reduction of the uh, as built condition of the deck. Mm -hmm. Right from the property line. Correct. That's correct. Yes, that's correct. That's been confirmed. Okay, uh, Commissioner Fitz. Um, I've got a couple of questions for staff 
on this one. And if you just answered this, I apologize. There's a bunch of feedback um, on the line when when Commissioner Mosley was talking. Does the does the deck go all the way up to the side property lines, or is it set back from the sides? It is. I think it matches the the width of the of that unit. Um, so if the unit met the setbacks, then the so it, so it does meet the five foot setback on the on that side, um, and is right up against the um, the other unit uh, that, that it kind of shares the the lot with. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another another question. I only know this because I was researching this for another project, but I, the and I realize we're dealing with a historic overlay and that that um, supersedes any any district bulk reg regulations. But the district bulk regulations allow decks to be within ten feet of the rear property line. So I guess I'm wondering where. Where is the? I couldn't. I couldn't quite find like in the referenced design guidelines sections where the twenty feet was coming from. Commissioner, this is Robin Ziegler. Um, it because it is so tall. It, there's actual usable space underneath, so it almost could be used like a carport. So codes looks at that a little differently, and it, the twenty foot is the required setback, and. The ability to change the setback for you was really created to address historic conditions. But there are no historic conditions here, which is why we're recommending just sticking with what codes would require. Commissioner Fitz, any other comments on that? Uh, not at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Mosley? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Commissioner Fitz, a great observation in terms of, of that. Uh, if you look at what's on the, um, in the application or, or I guess the overhead uh, aerial Google shot, I think is what it is, you kind of see that there is a deck. Uh, it's, it's a little harder to see what's on the screen currently, but there, there's a, a deck on the back of the unit that obviously is not um, able to be parked under. You can crawl under it, but you can't park under it. And then uh, somehow this upper level deck kind of it looks like it's kind of a split level situation between how the units come out is uh, creates a scenario where you can still, you know, fully use the parking pad for each unit. I imagine that's for a single, it appears that it's wide enough for a single car. Maybe it will squeeze two really narrow cars in there, but that therein I think lies the, part of the rub with, with what um, the staff has, uh, the has, has brought up is, is how that would be interpreted by the um, zoning administrator. And then if it's the zoning administrator, it further kicks to us. So it seems to me that if the zoning administrator somehow sees it differently, then if it just ruled as a deck, um, you know, perhaps the applicant has recourse that might not involve us but um i think i'll, I'll just add to what the Ziegler pointed out that this is not a single story garage on the back of you know the back of a of a residence as, as some of the other things that the applicant has pointed to in this block um, but it is indeed sort of a split level deck that has some mass and larger mass than some of the other things that were that were pointed out or referenced. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Mosley, thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bell. Um, I think applicant uh, mentioned about uh, some a document for to you know um, make his case and I have searched uh, the public uh, comment folder and you know our SharePoint and so forth. And for whatever the reason, I am not receiving uh, that uh, information packet. So would that be 
I mean, it would be really helpful for me to uh, gauge, you know, with visual and his point. And so, uh, unfortunately, I did not receive that packet. So I don't know if I should recuse myself because I'm able to, you know, gauge uh, correctly of uh, his position. Commissioner, so that would probably be the question to staff. Did we receive all the documents? Because um, it was sent on Monday. Commissioners, other commissioners, did you receive the seven page document that um, the applicant has referenced? Commissioner Price? No, I did not receive that. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, so how do we um, how do we reconcile this, Ms. Ziegler? Mr. Bonder, do you want to weigh in? Uh, Mr. This is Alex Dickerson. Mr. Blonder is in is uh, in another meeting right now. Um, so, if I understand correctly, there's a document that some commissioners have seen and other commissioners have not seen. Is that correct? Um, let, let's check this again, Alex. Uh, Commissioner Mayhall and Commissioner Jones, has, did you receive those? I have not received it that I can see. I... Okay, Commissioner Jones. Yeah, I have also have not received it. I I, I looked as he was speaking as well, um, and because it I didn't recall, and and I don't see it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to make a if the commission's going to make a decision um, based on certain on a document, it it would only be appropriate if the other commissioners had seen that. You could, uh, if the staff is comfortable with deferring this for one meeting, you could do that to pass out the document so you could address it. Uh, more appropriately at the next meeting if that's if that works for them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dickerson. I, I move uh, Chair Bell here. It sounds like that we did not receive that seven page document from Mr. Dunn. And so we will if do, uh, legal do we need to um, do we need to have a motion to defer this because of mm -hmm not having enough information? Well, first, I guess Alex Dickerson from Legal, uh, let me ask uh, Ms. Ziegler if she would be comfortable with, from staff's perspective with having this move to another meeting. Yes, we would. Okay, I mean, I would just ask the applicant if that's, if, if that's acceptable to them and then if everybody's on board, then you could just take a motion and do it that way. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dickerson. Um, Mr. Applicant? Um, it looks like that we are we'll probably agreed to defer if you are also in agreement, or would you like to go ahead and have us roll? Actually, I, I, yeah, I, I put a lot of work into that. And so, um, cause again, okay. I, I, I take what you're doing very, very seriously and I want it to be really responsive. So I'm more than welcome to, to wait a month if you want it, because I'd like you to be able to read the document. Okay, yes, yeah. absolutely. We appreciate that. Okay, um, Commissioner Price? Yes, I, I, uh, if you need another minute, Chair Bell, to say something, you, that's fine. Otherwise, I will move for deferral until next month's meeting. Okay, we are going to take that motion. Commissioner Johnson? Yes, I second the motion. Okay, yes, um, I'll agree. And I will. I will take the roll on that. For the record, um, and I think Vice Chair is can be able to vote. Uh, Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley. Uh, yeah. Quick, quick point of order. Um, sure. Chair, I, I think I, I, there was reference to the document. I, I certainly haven't seen them. It sounds like there are none of the commissioners have seen this document. Right. And um, normally, uh, again, just make sure we're on the up and up. And, and I think legal would 
Ron Lutz, I'm hoping legal would, would take this point on order um, or agree with it, that this potentially presents new information that was not previously available to us. That would be the only way that we could well, it wouldn't be the only way, but uh, I think that would be the proper way for us to defer this, which the applicant has agreed to. But I just wanted to make sure that that was entered into the record. And my vote is. Okay, Mr. Dickerson. Uh, yes, this is Alex Dickerson. I think that's appropriate for to be entered into the record. Okay, for the record. All right. Um, I'm not sure who I called last. Is this Commissioner Johnson? <laughs> Did Commissioner Johnson re respond? Yes. Uh, oh. I, oh, yes, you did. Yes, yes you did. I did. And, yes, and, and by the way, thank you for uh, bringing this to our attention, and uh, it was quite important to do that, so thank you. Um, and Commissioner Jones, I believe. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley, I believe you said that too as well. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, very good. An, an unusual uh, situation, but we are learning, and uh, thank you for everyone's patience on that and, and processing. Okay, um, we will now move on to 1807 Woodland Street, and Mr. Hoffman will be our presenter. Um, the number for the public to call is 629-255-1911. Eight ten oh seven Woodland Street is a contributing home in the Lachlan Springs East End District. The historic porch roof was altered as part of renovations that were undertaken in uh, 2020 and 21. Uh, historically, the porch roof was the shed roof form seen here. Staff finds that this original roof form was character defining feature of the house and that its removal meets section 3ba for inappropriate demolition also additions are generally approved at the rear of buildings not at the front so the new porch roof does not meet section 2b10 for additions as it is also not compatible in scale with the historic porch roof staff recommends disapproval of the new construction finding that the project meet uh, sections 210a and b for additions and 3b1 for demolition in the Lachlan Springs design guidelines, staff recommends that the applicant submit to scale drawings indicating major measure, measure, measurements and materials to replicate the original porch form within 60 days of the commission's decision and to restore the original form within an additional 30 days. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. And I'll just see if the applicant is on the line. I don't see that. Commissioner, did you have a question to staff at the moment? I, I did. This is Commissioner Mosley. I wanted to clarify um, the pictures from the more recent pictures um, are void of some of the architectural um, gingerbread or detailing that was present in the earlier pictures. And, and I just wanted to clarify if that was a requirement of the applicant or if we're talking merely the, the form be returned would be the minimum that the applicant would need to provide. I mean, the scope, uh, this is Paul Hoffman, the, the scope of work commissioner that that we're referring to is, is specific to the, the porch roof form. Um, the project didn't require a preservation permit um, because it was uh, supposed to be a uh, interior uh, rehab work, there was some some work done on windows, uh, siding, uh, but the the part of the the work that that is a violation is that porch roof form. Okay, we might have more questions. Um, again, it doesn't look like our the applicant is present. Um, do we have any public comment? Do we have any call-ins? No. Okay, no call-ins. Chair Bill, I, I had a yes. further, further clarification from, okay. from, from staff. Okay, I'm sorry. About, yeah, I think that um, I was referring, in figure five in the staff report, there is some detailing around the porch rack 
that um, again for clarity for the for the applicant one understand um, if uh, that certainly would be appropriate if they added that uh, or, or replicated that given pictorial evidence of what historically was there but uh, I think I understand um, Mr. Hoffman to say that the roof form is the minimum uh, that would be required of the applicant to both draw, submit to the staff, and re reconstruct. Okay. Not necessarily the detailing that's shown in the picture for a circa 1969. That's correct, Commissioner. Okay. I think that was probably more for our discussion, Commissioner, but we'll just keep moving on. Um, if we don't have any public comment, uh, Ms. Ziegler, do you have anything that came in through email or anything? Okay. So I think I closed public hearing. <laughs> if not, I'm closing public hearing now. And um, we have further discussion if there are any buzz commissioners and if Commissioner Mosley still has other comments. Commissioner Price. Commissioner Price. If you're talking, you're on mute. Commissioner Price. Yes, I think you just called on me, but I'm, I'm getting a lot of, uh, there's a lot of breakup in the phone call. Um, Okay, is I that just, better? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, given the evidence that's been provided and the fact that the applicant is not here, uh, I think this is a pretty clear case of exactly what it's being called a violation um, for work that was not permitted. It's on the facade of uh, this house, which is usually the receives the highest scrutiny and uh, for any kind of addition like this. So I move to um, approve the staff recommendation for removal. That's okay, it. there's a motion. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Commissioner, were you interrupted? No, okay. I'm done, thank you. Um, okay, so we've made a motion and I see the, um, Commissioner Williams. I second the motion. Okay, there's a motion on the floor and I will call the roll. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. And um, did we have 1716 Greenwood? Was that off on the it's deferred? Fine. Okay, still have that on my list. Okay, the next um, will be for the project 3616A Westbrook Avenue. And the public can call in to 629-255-1911. And Ms. Warren will be our presenter. Yes, this is an application for infill on a vacant lot in Richland West End. The commission disapproved an application on this lot last year. The applicant has revised based on feedback at that hearing. The context includes one and one and a half story houses, ranging in height from about 17 to 32 feet. Houses on comparably sized lots range in width from about 29 to 44 feet. The height and width of the proposed structure fit in with these parameters. One small issue is that this front dormer needs to be inset by two feet. The applicant has agreed to this revision. Staff finds that the proposal is appropriate in terms of height, massing, materials, and roof form. The depth of the structure was at issue in the previous application as the house and outbuilding were connected via an enclosed hallway underneath the pool. The applicant has pulled these structures apart, which staff finds to be appropriate. The design meets all setback requirements as well. A garage is planned for the rear yard off the alley. The design and location meet all of the design guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed house with the condition that the dormer be inset two feet and the standard conditions as seen here. Okay, thank you, Ms. Warren. 
I believe the applicant has her hand raised. Please announce yourself. Yes, hi, this is Julia Grissett with Gilbert McLaughlin Costello Architects. I'm representing the applicant. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, like Jenny said, that we have no objections with any of the conditions that were listed and to thank Jenny for all her hard work uh, revising this with us. Okay, thank you for working with staff as well. So um, we will um, see if there's any call-ins for public comment. Okay, none, and so I'll, therefore I will close public hearing. And commissioners, questions or a motion? Commissioner Price? Yeah, I wanna thank the applicant for uh, working with staff to revise what was previously a rejected proposal. Uh, I think it looks like a really good project and I move for approval. Okay, there's a motion and Commissioner Mayhall? I second that motion. All right, and I will call the roll on that. And we are at Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. And Commissioner Williams. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And we will move to 3800 Central Avenue. And Ms. Baldock will be the presenter. And the number for the public to call in is 629-255-1911. 3800 Central is an application for a one-story addition that includes an attached garage. Attached garages do not meet the design guidelines in the Richland West End neighborhood unless they are at the basement level, which is, this one is not. In addition, the footprint of the addition more than doubles the footprint of the lot. Staff has been working with the applicant um, on this one, and um, they have submitted revisions that do um, incorporate all of staff's comments. And so, um, you know, if if the commission agrees with the conditions um, that are proposed here, uh, staff will you know, staff finds that the revisions they've since sent us um, just this morning do meet all of these conditions. So um, we are recommending approval with the condition that the garage be fully detached with a minimum of 20 feet in between the garage and the addition. The addition's footprint being new, no larger than 1,775 square feet, which pretty much is the maximum to, um, you know, no more than double the footprint of the house. Uh, and then at least one double home window remain in the gable field. The concrete block foundation be split face. Staff approve all windows and doors and all materials prior to purchase insulation. There will be no wall spaces deeper than 13 feet without a window or door opening, and that staff approve the HVAC location. So with these conditions, staff finds that the proposed addition meets Section 2B and 3B of the design guidelines. Okay. Thank you very much. So do we have the applicant? Okay. I don't see the applicant name on there. Um, do we have any public comment? No public comment. We will close public hearing. And commissioners. Commissioner Jones. Uh, yes, uh, being in a, uh, approval of uh, all of staff's comments on this original project um, and the fact that they've now worked with them to meet all of these conditions, I um, will move for approval um, of the project with all staff recommendations for 3800 Central Avenue. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there a second? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will second the motion. Okay, there is a motion on the floor and we will call the roll. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Commissioner? Yes. David, thank you. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? 
Yes. Okay. We will be hearing a 2005 or Perrin 2003 Eastland Avenue. Ms. Warren will be the presenter and the public can call in to 629-255-1911. Okay, this is an application for infill on a vacant lot in Eastwood. As a quick clarification, the lot sits between number 2001 there on the left and number 2005 on the right. Currently, the address for the lot is also number 2005, but it will likely become number 2003. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, the context includes one and one and a half story houses ranging in height from about 18 feet to just under 29 feet and ranging in width from about 28 to about 32 feet. The proposed ridge will be approximately 28 feet 7 inches, and that will match that of the house next door at number 2005. The proposed foundation and eave heights are compatible with the immediate context. The proposed width will be about 32 feet at the front, which matches the house to the left. Staff finds that the proposal is appropriate in terms of height, massing, materials, and roof form. The design meets all setback requirements. A garage is planned for the rear yard off the alley. The design and location meet all of the design guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed house with the standard conditions as seen here. I know the applicant is here and I believe wishes to speak. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Applicant, please announce yourself. Yes, this is Aaron Armstrong at 1305 Forest Avenue. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank Jenny and the rest of the staff we deferred last month to give us more time to work through some revisions and get in line with staff's recommendations. And I think we were ultimately able to come up with a really great uh, end product and we appreciate everybody's time. And we're really excited about the opportunity to build here, both myself and my business partner on this transaction, um, Drew Sloss or East Nashville residents. And we know it's a highly visible lot. And so we're looking forward to have the opportunity to uh, add what we feel like will be a great home to that property. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Applicant. Okay, we have any public comment? Yes, we have received an email from Council Member Withers, which I'll read, but I believe he's with us as well, so just in case he may want to add to this. But he said, I wanted to write a quick note in support of the infill application for the vacant lot at 2003 Eastland Avenue. I'm glad that a project is coming forward for this parcel in an area where housing is needed. At one point in, in time several years ago, an expansion of the Eastwood Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay had delayed by a prior council member due to uncertainty about what belonged on this vacant parcel, since there are no two-story mixed-use and townhome complexes nearby. Ultimately, the overlay expansion went through that helps to shape infill in this mid-block location surrounded by contributing structures on either side and mostly contributing structures across the street. Since Eastland Ave forms the shared boundary between the Eastwood and Lachlan Springs neighborhoods, both groups have traditionally worked to ensure that any new infill closely matches the scale of the immediately surrounding historic houses, which in this block of Eastland are fairly modest and relatively close to the street. I agree with the staff recommendation that while this proposed building is tall and as wide as the largest contributing homes in that block, the cross gable form, the low eave height, the traditional porch structure, and overall simple or clean lines help it to blend in well with surroundings. It will complement the historic rhythm, spacing, and roof shape patterns of this block without distracting from the contributing structures themselves, notably the one to the left, 2001 Eastland, that is an architecturally distinctive house in this area. I appreciate the architect's work in bringing a thoughtful proposal to this highly visible parcel with heavy foot traffic. I encourage the commission to support staff recommendation. And that concludes his email. Okay. Councilman Withers. Would you like to have any other comment? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Do we have any call-ins? No. Okay, no calls. So there are no other comments, so we will close public hearing. And commissioners discuss or make a motion. Vice Chair, did you have a comment? Yes, um, Madam Chairman, with respect to uh, 2003 Eastland Avenue, I move, move for approval with staff conditions. Thank you, sir. Is there a second? Commissioner Fitz? I second that motion. Thank you. 
We have a motion on the floor, and I will take roll. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you. So our next uh, project is 2010, I guess, zero, North 11th Street. And our presenter will be Mr. Alexander. And the number to call in is 629-255-1911. All right, this is an application to construct a new mixed use building with a corner commercial component and a row of six attached townhouses. The building will address North 11th Street and Forest Avenue, and both components of the building will have three stories. The Five Points area of East Nashville included one and two story commercial buildings historically with heights and widths consistent with the two-story primary street-facing form of the current proposal. Uh, townhouse forms are not common in this area historically. However, the proposed development is near the edge of the overlay where the context transitions from residential to an institutional and even commercial. Um, the commercial component will have a two-story front wall, 26 feet, six inches, tall at the parapet with a third story stepped back 10 feet from both street facing facades and eight feet from the north facade, uh, which is adjacent to a historic building to the left. This third story will have a flat roof and that roof will be 36 feet tall. The townhouse component along Forest Avenue will also have a two story street facing facade, 26 feet tall, with the third story step back 10 feet from the street facing facade and from the right side facade, uh, which is adjacent to an alley to the east. Staff finds that stepping back, uh, stepping in of the third story from the two primary facades and from the north and east facades where the building is adjacent to historic residential forms helps to keep the height compatible with surrounding context. As the townhouses extend 140 feet to the east along Forest Avenue, the facade is broken into six units, each unit articulated into several smaller wall sections. This helps to break up the scale of the building. The primary building materials will be brick and cement fiber siding with aluminum storefront doors and type store uh, doors and windows. Uh, additional information is needed on the material and selections, including colors and textures, uh, and staff asks to be able to approve those administratively. Uh, I also have some color drawings in the, in the presentation. Staff recommends approval of the proposed mixed-use infill at the corner of North 11th Street and Forest Avenue, with a condition that staff shall review the brick selection siding reveal and texture, metal colors, and the materials of the front stoop stairs and railing. Meeting that condition, staff finds that the project meets the design guidelines for new construction in the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. If the applicant is on the line would like to speak, please announce yourself. Yeah, this is Jason Hitchcock with Powell Architecture and Building Studio representing the property owner. Um, I again want to thank both Sean Alexander and Councilman member uh, Brett Withers for working with us. We um, have diligently worked over the past several months to adhere to the guidelines and respond to the community um, as the design pertains to the corner of 11th and Forest. And I believe that we have a pretty successful um, design that we're proposing here and would like to again just thank everybody for their involvement and being able to work back and forth to come to the solution that we have presented here and um i'd like to reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal to any comments okay this is chair bell and in your um process 
Did you engage community for comment? Um, we did not directly. We um, have been working with Councilman Withers as our community outreach uh, through the process as representing part of the community, as well as working with the property owner who um, lives in the neighborhood. Okay, Councilman Withers. Thank you so much, Chair Barrell. I mean, I'm happy to um, answer any questions commissioners have at this moment. I do have some comments to share, but didn't know if it might be more appropriate to wait until the end of any public comment. So, okay. Whichever preference you have. <laughs> sure, sure. We'll see if we have any call-ins, but you're definitely on the line. Uh, there were some, this is Sean Alexander. There were some emails which were forwarded to the commissioners. Um, I believe those were in opposition. Uh, I don't think there were any three in opposition. Uh, and we have no calls on the line. Okay. And I think we had some written emails as well that were posted. Correct. Yes, okay, so we have transparency on that. Um, Councilman Withers, you're welcome to, welcome to give us your um, other comments. All right, well, thank you everyone for your consideration. And again, uh, as it relates to the discussion that we had earlier about the design guideline consolidation project and uh, sort of uh, reflecting that the Five Points Redevelopment District did expire, um, I really want to provide, uh, and I'll try to do that as briefly as I can, but some background for why this parcel is unique and is not uh, a typical, you wouldn't, I, I don't think, uh, look at context at, on this particular parcel in the way that you would quite in any other parcel in the Lachlan Springs area. Obviously, the the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association began working on the conservation overlay in 1985. Uh, then much later on began to work on the uh, Five Points Redevelopment District. And so you have an interesting situation where the conservation overlay design guidelines, at least initially are older and the, um, the Five Points Redevelopment District uh, design guidelines are, are more recent and have actually been updated numerous times um, uh, over, over the vast about 30 years. And so one of the things that I think is, is interesting about this parcel that I think it's helpful to everyone to know is that, uh, um, again, the redevelopment district guidelines were applied later. They were themselves constructed through very extensive community input and engagement. The neighborhoods worked very closely with MDHA on that. Uh, that happened as a result of the RUDAT in 1999. The RUDAT specifically had the goal of creating a mixed use and commercial area in Five Points that did not exist prior to that. So that's a very different goal for the Five Points area than for the rest of the neighborhood. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is that the um, redevelopment district was uh, planned where there were different subdistricts. And so if you look at the houses across the street from this on Forest, those were in a residential subdistrict that called for residential forms. The this block of North 11th was in what's called the Five Points subdistrict, which had explicitly called for commercial forms. And I think that's a really interesting background to have because ordinarily you would sort of look at the houses, but there is so much documented evidence that what the community stated that they wanted on this parcel specifically uh, was a commercial form. Um, and so that is why I think we, we have had really good questions about why are the setbacks not contextual even to the, the former house next door and whatnot. And that reason is that the community themselves worked on design guidelines that specifically called for a commercial form on this parcel that would have been uh, built to the sidewalk with, uh, with two stories built to the sidewalk with a third floor step back. And that is what this form represents. So even though, like I say, the uh, in a typical lot, like in a mid-block location or something like that, you would definitely uh, ha have a little bit more modest scale ordinarily, even if it is a commercial structure. I, uh, in working with all the property owners and the neighborhood associations uh, over the last year and a half uh, with the expiration of the redevelopment district, have spent a lot of time with these documents. And there's just so, so much documented evidence that's very specific to this parcel that says that what the community wanted or envisioned on this parcel was a commercial form 
uh, with two, two floors uh, built to the sidewalk with a third floor step back. So that is additional uh, context that wanted to provide. The, uh, in addition to that, there is the, also, again, very, very interesting context of, you know, how do the conservation overlay guidelines and the redevelopment districts interact? And what we have found is that the commission uh, has entertained, particularly along 11th, um, has entertained these buildings that met the redevelopment district guidelines that have more of a townhouse form and has approved them. Uh, not all of them have been constructed actually, but there is uh, a, a large body of evidence. Uh, if you start at the south, um, the 37206 building at the northwest corner of 11th and Fatherland is a full three stories built to the street. Across the street from that next to Bill Martin's is the MC3 or Martin Corner three townhomes full three stories. They do have a little bit of a front yard in front, but they are a full three stories all the way into the neighborhood. Uh, just around the corner at 10th and Russell, there's the Faro at Five Points project that was approved by the commission. Those represent as uh, two stories with a third floor step back on 10th, but a full three, th three floors straight up on the Russell Street sidewalk uh, into the neighborhood. There is the Van Dyke building at 10, uh, 107 South, 105 South 11th, not everyone's favorite building, came before the commission, the commission approved it. That building uh, the, has two stories built to the street with a 30 foot parapet wall with a third floor 15 feet higher than that. And that is all just along 11th Street. What I did a little bit of note taking for some of the other applications uh, the, the parapet wall that is proposed on this building is much lower than that. It's 26 uh, at the street, and, and even the third floor height is different. And really, to, to even look at um, some other things that are further in the neighborhood that the commission has looked at and approved um, at the corner of 16th and Ordway uh, is 1516 Ordway Place. It was approved in, by the commission in August of 2020. Uh, it is That one is only two stories, but it's much more internal but it has a uh, front height of 26 feet to the parapet at the front and in the rear because of top topography, it's 33 feet off the alley uh, with the 36 feet uh, that then expands out to 40 um, with a depth of 95 uh, feet. And so that, uh, that building in terms of the parapet wall is um, almost identical to this building with the exception that this one does have that third floor that's a uh, step back that is called for in the redevelopment district. So again, I think that one to me is one of the most uh, most persuasive about what the commission has recommended in the past in these corner commercial locations, which is what this parcel is called out to be, even when you have residential next door with a traditional front yard next door, is that uh, 1516 Ordway Place, again, the front height of 26 feet, which is almost identical to this with a parapet, um, uh, and then uh, uh, very, very close to the sidewalk for almost the entire length of the parcel. So um, those are reasons why, you know, again, I think that there is, there's a lot of history of community involvement uh, stating that what belongs on this parcel is not a residential form, but a commercial form, stating what it should look like. It should have ground floor retail with residential, which this does. It should have uh, a third floor step back. Um, and th this project has responded to that. It was originally a, quite a bit larger than it actually, and we have been working with the staff since uh, late last year on several revisions. Um, we have had discussions. The Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Board, to my knowledge, hasn't taken a public position on it, but um, uh, uh, Nathan Oliver, who's the president of the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association, has met myself and the, uh, the original staff architect, Manly Seal, on site uh, to get some feedback. Um, and, and there was a staff change at, uh, at, there at Powell so that uh, we have we have someone uh, who picked pick that up when the staff changed. But one of the, the additional things that we're responding to in this project is that there are concerns in the neighborhood about parking. And so these townhomes do have pull under rear pull under garages, which uh, is another reason why they need a little bit of height in order to respond to uh, the neighborhood concerns about parking, which is legitimate. So it does have pull under parking uh, with one full floor and then a, a third floor step back. Some additional feedback that I have received from folks in Lachlan Springs is that they, in the sort of recessed areas, that they 
would like a little bit more green space maybe in those those recessed bays. And uh, the architect has actually uh, responded to that and they believe that they could do some minor modifications to those front uh, bays so that they can accommodate, you know, putting, um, you know, green space and planting beds in, in those recessed bays to help soften the impact on the street. Um, some additional feedback that I've had from neighbors uh, is, you know, again, related to the residential form. If someone were to do a residential form on this parcel, it would likely be a two and a half story, four square building like the one next door. And I think there's potential that that could sort of loom over the street more than doing this version and excavating it and really addressing the street all along Forest in particular and kind of activating that street more rather than having a very large building sit on top of a hill and loom over them. Um, but I, I think those are, like I said, just some, some background things I wanted to share about the very unique history of this parcel, the community calling for a commercial form. And also I think staff are absolutely right. The context in Five Points is, um, I, I guess I would call it eclectic. So the commission has approved another uh, at, Main and Forest, which is within eyesight of this, has approved a building that is uh, two floors to pair with the third floor built to the sidewalk. Then there are some kind of commercial buildings with parking in front. There, there's the East Library parking garage along the street. Um, there are some single story houses. There is a gas station um, out of the five corners of five points. Three of the lots are either surface parking lots or a gas station. Uh, a lot of times what you find for the heart of Five Points is that the most distinctive and memorable features are not the buildings themselves, but the murals that are on them. And so I think that this is, again, one of those things where you need to take context, uh, not only historically, uh, what the community feedback has been about it, but also looking a little bit more broadly to say that it really is an eclectic context right there, certainly as it goes into the to the east along Forest, you wanted to step uh, step back, and the architects have designed it in a way to do that with that last easternmost unit. And they've also agreed to work on maybe tweaking those uh, front bays a little bit more to add some uh, 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 trees and stuff, even within the bays, in addition to the trees, the street trees that they would have to uh, install along the new sidewalks. So I think that's, I've said a lot, but that, those are my <laughs> comments for now. And if you have any other questions for me, please let me know. Councillor Withers, <laughs> that, that was, uh, that was uh, a lot to absorb. And, and yes, but so, so helpful, this is Chair Bell, to hear the historical context um, information and also that the community was involved initially and um, just how eclectic East Nashville and, and your district is. So we do thank you for your articulation and also that um, to give us uh, some more meat to the matter. Um, so thank you, we appreciate that. Since we don't have any other public comment, we're gonna close public hearing and commissioners, Commissioner Fitz. I will go ahead and jump in on this one. Um, I wanna thank council member uh, Withers and the applicant for kind of explaining some of the history of the project. And while understanding that the desire of the community was to have a you know, commercial type use and building in this location, I am really struggling with the transition on the 11th, um, 11th Street and Forest Avenue on, on both the transition to the context because I feel like context is everything. I feel like you can have a commercial building and also respect the surrounding context. This is a really um, unusual and different block. You've got the old library across the street. You've got the church. You've got the old four square on the same side of the street and building right up to the sidewalk on 11th and then that transition to this building. It just feels completely awkward to me and that there is just not a smooth transition. I don't feel like it's really making 
that transition or trying to make that transition, especially on the 11th Street side. Um, I guess bumping it out on Forest, that I don't have as much of a problem um, building out to the sidewalk on Forest, but I, I really do have an issue with it on 11th. I just feel like it, it, it doesn't, I feel like there's a way to, to accomplish a commercial building on the site without building right up to the sidewalk, especially with this unique context on the street. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mayhaw. Well, I appreciate what Commissioner Fitz has to say. I, I drove by this lot this morning and, and you know, you look one way, you see five points, you see, look one or the other way, you see Gallatin Road, a very busy intersections both. And um, I, I just got a very kind of commercial feel uh, 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 of that street. And it's very unusual. Um, the Carnegie Library is beautiful, but it's pretty far away. Um, so I, 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 I don't have a, a, an issue with, with this structure in this area. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Price. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair Bell. I wanted to thank Councilman Withers. Uh, I, I am a Lockland Springs resident and very familiar with this uh, property. Uh, I also drove and walked by today. Um, I have spent a lot of time thinking about this uh, and considering all of the various viewpoints that I know are out there con uh, concerning setback and scale and massing and the unusual nature of the lot and the very variety, the, the varied context. Uh, it, it's, it is kind of an, it's an odd bird for, um, for us to consider. Uh, and I'll even say this, and Councilman Withers, I think will appreciate this. I even read all 650 comments on the East Nashville Facebook post about it, um, which if you've ever seen our neighborhood Facebook page, you know it's uh, pretty harrowing place to, to wade in. Um, that said, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, Councilman Withers um, putting this in the historical context of quite literally 20 years of community planning uh, and community feedback and resident um, desires or, or, you know, expressing what, what, they, what they want five points to be in general and then also, you know, what's appropriate for this lot. Uh, given all of the other properties that are precedents for building, you know, to the sidewalk um, or mixed use projects that Brett mentioned earlier up and down 11th, there's, there's plenty of precedent here. Uh, I, I don't think that this development would be necessarily appropriate, certainly not interior in the neighborhood, but this transitional lot right here, um, I, th I think it's a good project. I appreciate the applicants working with Brett and the staff on stepping back and, and kind of scaling down what, you know, I, think, I believe last month it was originally on our agenda, but was pulled by the applicant because it was recommended for disapproval. So, you know, they've, they've gone back and done their homework and uh, I, I, support, I support the project as it is. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Jones. Uh, yes, upon researching this one before the meeting, you know, I, I have to say I was, you know, struck by, you know, I, you know, go to Rosemary, which is across Forest, and, you know, all of those are, are one-story homes, and, and then seeing this lot, and I kind of thought, you know, well, that, to me, doesn't seem to fit, and again, and I'm still a little bit also in agreement with um, Commissioner Fitz um, and her points on that, but, you know, hearing... Um, Councilman Withers, you know, background that, that I did not know. I, I'm not an East Nashville resident um, on that uh, has moved me closer, I think, to to approval. Um, I still just am kind of scared uh, or, you know, hesitant, just the size and massing of it um, right on the sidewalk still um, just seems hard to, to gather that it's across the street from one story, you know, forms. Um, so I'm trying to kind of get my head around that, but 
you know, that it is what, you know, that it's always been intended to be a commercial structure. Um, you know, does it have to be that big? Is, again, I kind of as a point that Commissioner Fitz made that I'm that I'm in agreement with almost. So um, those are my thoughts at this time. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bell. Um, I was looking at this as a, uh, not only historic, but also planning a point of view. So what is uh, the policy for this uh, specific corner? So it calls for neighborhood center. So that means, you know, adjacent neighbor be able to walk there and gather there and some kind of commercial activity. To encourage that, I think, you know, closer to the street kind of makes sense. And uh, so as, you know, uh, Councilman Weathers said, uh, because to create a uh, parking space, uh, therefore needs, uh, you know, a little bit high to accommodate a parking space in the building. And I think it's kind of, you know, scary to have a different looking building uh, in that, uh, you know, traditionally historic content. But I think, you know, we have accommodated uh, this type of building in certain corners. And also, uh, I really like the uh, setback, the third story because if it was to come out it would be too massive that setback and you know going forward uh if they can uh, create more tree space and green space to soften more uh i think it has potential to blend in with uh, this historic uh context so for that i i uh, intend to agree with uh, staff analysis Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Price, did you mean to have your hand raised again? Oh, sorry, no, thank you. No worries. Uh, um, Chair Bell here, and I know this is a significant project and, and it's so good to have discussion like this. And I know that, that this property as well, because we frequent Pizza, Pizza, Pizza Real. Um, that, that building is gonna, stay is that correct Staff? uh yes pizza real uh the building to the left of this one 203 north 11th street is a contributing building uh and we've recently approved a rear addition to that building. right it's a beautiful historic uh structure and i also echo a couple of the commissioner's concern about uh cautioning it with the context to the historical con you know buildings and the houses that have always you know some of them have been commercial and also how commissioner johnson had said to soften um you know the structure and i have seen over the years where these integrated developments can can look daunting in in the midst of residential um context and so um yes on one side there's you know, Gallatin Road, you've got the beautiful church and also um, the library, but yet when when a vacant lot has been vacant for a while and the neighborhood and residents have not seen, you know, they've seen green land for a while, green space, it is a bit um, taking a pause on, on what is gonna be in front of my house. So, uh, which is historical. So we, we do look at how this context will um, be absorbed in, in this type of situation. Um, so I think also I echo again the commissioners in terms of how to soften the sharp edges of, of this development. Uh, it's very square. Um, it is grounding in terms of an architectural viewpoint, um, but yet it is um, quite um, maybe uh, too vertical uh, uh, in terms of how you look at it with the other co the historical context. So it's kind of my, my um, observation. Commissioners? Mm 
Commissioner Price. Yeah, um, to your point about uh, softening, and there's been some discussion. I think uh, Councilman Withers mentioned street street tree requirement. I was wondering if he or the applicant could address that. What what is this the plan? Because the, the the views we're seeing here don't show any any vegetation, but I know that is going to be something that's required. I, I, I'd like to know a little more detail about what the plan is there for the planting strip for street trees, how many, um, what what are the requirements there? Commissioner, just one moment of just a comment is that, of course, landscaping and such is not our purview. Um, however, it is um, something that we would look at in terms of aesthetics. Uh, yeah, so um, just just to give ourselves just a that that's really not within our purview, but absolutely right. a good point. Yeah, uh, I, I, I I understand that. I'm just curious, and I sort of wish right. maybe there was one right. view of right. these four that showed uh, more of that detail. Sure. sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mayhall. Um, as far as the structure itself, I, I've got a question for Sean. Uh, I know you're going to uh, choose uh, the brick selection. You're going to approve that. Hey, do you have any feeling or, or, or um, could you give me kind of an idea of what color brick would be acceptable? And I'm thinking that perhaps the color of the brick might help blend this building, might, might look better than this, than what we see here. So Sean, do you have any idea what what you would approve there for brick? Uh, we typically require brick to be, uh, well, we look to the surrounding context and, and in most places that ends up dictating that, that a appropriate brick color is in the red family. There are some areas that have a little bit more or different variety of bricks, but I, I think in this part of the neighborhood, um, the majority of, of bricks that we would want this to be compatible with are going to be red bricks. Um, however, uh, uh, the, this applicant did a, a similar project uh, about a block away, and uh, we required bricks to, for, that, for that project to be red, although, as I understand it, they intend to, to paint the structure. So, so um, we're still going to require red. Uh, before anything else happens. Thank you. Commissioner Mayhall, did you have any other comment on that? No, I, I just think that that would soften this project a little bit. Sure, of course, we also have requirements that, uh, you know, Sean has mentioned. So um, hopefully we're, we're all listening, right, developers? So um, that we can have further discussion about that when you take it to staff. Commissioner Fitz. I'm just gonna speak up again. I feel like, you know, we had a case earlier today where we were so stringent on the transition from the commercial structure to the residential adjacent to it. And as this structure transitions to the Pizza Real building, as it transitions to the the homes on forest and the homes across the street. I, I don't feel like it's addressing those transitions well. It, they feel very abrupt. And so I just wanted to state that again. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. I also um, echo those sentiments. Um, architects, do you have any comments on this? Commissioner Mosley. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't. I don't have any um, any sage comment. I'm, I'm uh, certainly listening and, and struggling through a lot of um, a lot of issues here. I think if you look at this outside of the pure context of, of the guidelines, which you know, really we really can't and shouldn't do, um, it, it's a you know it's a good commercial. Well, mixed use infill project, uh, it, you know, it checks checks a lot of the boxes um, for that. Uh, I think there's a lot of zoning things that are tools that are being used here. Um, you know, the, the commercial space is 
is small enough that it requires no parking, um, and therefore you're allowed, you know, you're able to, with a cantilever, you know, squeeze in into into you know, six six residential units and kind of maximize this property. Um, it does those things very well. You know, I think, as Mr. Fitz has pointed out, by doing those things well, uh, you know, does it fit well in the guidelines in the context of the neighborhood? I'm having a hard time reconciling that myself um, as well. I, I think um, not. Um, I'm not in disagreement with the history that um, kind of comes along with this this lot, as uh, Councilman Withers has, has pointed out, and to an amount of previous um, input that that a commercial um, structure would would be appropriate here. And, and a lot of times, that those those types of developments would meet the street, but this this certainly um, packs a lot in, and, and even with some gives, it sounds like that it's happened over the very recent past. In further conversation with the neighborhood, um, still a lot to pack on the on the property. Mm -hmm. um, you're pointing out that there is a well, cars are parked there. There's a 15 foot setback. Um, I'm not sure if that would be considered a side or a rear, depending on this lot. I think officially faces North 11th, so maybe it's a rear setback that. You're parking cars and you have a full width of an alley right away of, let's assume it's 18 feet. Um, yeah, it gives some relief. It's, it's, it's not as close um, necessarily to, as a project that Commissioner Fitz you know, previously reviewed, but certainly the context for all intents and purposes is the same. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm having, um, um, yeah, I don't have anything else. I, I, those are my observations. And, Certainly, still struggling with whether this is appropriate um, within the guidelines. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair Stewart. You know, it is a difficult project, and uh, in this neighborhood, this part of town, like so many others, has changed so drastically in the last number of years. I, I, I have a great deal of respect. Uh, for the thoughtful deliberations and sensitivity that Councilman Withers has, and uh, and his comments help me with this project. Um, I, I I do think that you know we are returning to a time where uh, where there are mixed use projects uh, that uh, live right within neighborhoods, and uh, and I think for the most part, especially if those include residential, uh, they wind up uh, enhancing the neighborhoods and having commercial that is walkable. Uh, so uh, I, I do understand and uh, respect the opinion that it is an abrupt structure for right across the street from the homes. I, I know that we can't require, but would hope that the, uh, the developer would respect uh, the guidelines that were developed for brick color uh, and I know we can't require that it not be painted, but I do think that a red brick color or something that the staff would feel appropriate for that setting would help to soften the impact of this uh, this project uh, in this neighborhood. Uh, with, with all that said, uh, I would like to go ahead and, and move for approval of 201 North 11th Street uh, with the conditions uh, recommended by the staff. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Is there a second? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair Bell. I will second the motion. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. I will take the roll and please say yes or no. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. No. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. No. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay. So it looks like that the motion passes. Okay. Um, just to have the a little bit more this that um, again it has been a really good discussion and um, Councilman Withers again we thank you for giving us the background because uh, that that it was very helpful um, and again perhaps the developer could 
bend their ear on how those that have, have had caution on the abruptness of this to the neighborhood, that there would be some other softening details that you could add um, to this project to um, you know, soften it to, to the neighborhood. So thank you everyone and we'll see how that project comes out. The next is the 920B Ackland Avenue and Ms. Baldock will be our presenter. Uh, the number to call in is 629-255-1911. 920B Ackland is a revised design for infill on the leftmost lot of a larger lot that was divided into four parcels. The commission has approved the designs of the of two story houses and three of the other neighboring lots and those houses are under construction and largely finished. So you can see in the top photo, um, kind of the three newish houses are part of this former lot in development. Here is the design for the infill, which is similar in height and scale to the other infills approved next door and also are similar to the height and scale of the neighboring historic houses. Here is the design for the outbuilding and also the site plan. Um, the outbuilding meets all of the design guidelines and the project overall meets all of the setbacks. So staff is recommending approval of the project with our standard conditions regarding finished floor height and approval of materials and the location of the HVAC units. Okay, that's the end? <laughs> that is the end, sorry, yes. Uh, I'm not end. sure, I think the applicant, I think might be tuning in, but um, since we didn't have any requests to changes, I'm not sure if he uh, wants to comment, so. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ms. Baldock. I, I was just, uh, I, I had a had hanging <laughs> sentence there, so <laughs> thank you for that uh, confirmation. And applicant, you're welcome to, otherwise you can pass. Okay, I see that you're unmuted. However, if you choose not to, we will um, go to public comment. Okay, are there any public comments? No. Okay, any call-ins? No. Okay, no call-ins. So we will close public hearing. Commissioners, Vice Chair Stewart. Uh, Madam Chairman, with respect to 920B Ackland Avenue, I move for approval uh, with staff recommended uh, conditions. Thank you. Commissioner Jones? I second the motion. Okay. I will take the roll on the motion. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you, commissioners. And we will go to zero Manila Avenue. And Mr. Alexander will be our presenter. And the number to call is 629-255. One nine one one. Uh, this application is a proposal to construct a new two-story house with an attached garage on a vacant lot. The house will be two stories with a gabled L form with a side gabled primary massing. Uh, go ahead and move to the next slide. There you go. Uh, side gable primary massing with gable projections to the front and rear. The front projection will come five feet forward of the primary mass and then have a six foot deep shed roof front porch. The rear gable will project to 10 feet and will be two stories with the side facing garage door in the first story. Attached garages are not typical of the area but this lot is not served by an alley, and it has a unique shape and very steep slope, which complicate the ability to have a detached garage. 
The house will be 34 feet wide, which is uh, 6 to 10 feet wider than a typical historic house in the area. But this lot is actually three times the width of a typical lot, so staff found that to be appropriate. The house will be 33 feet 8 inches tall from the finished floor with an eave height of 20 feet. Uh, with the foundation height shown on the plans, the total height would be 35 feet tall from grade. Uh, this is taller than historic houses in the immediate vicinity and is taller than a recently constructed house on the adjacent lot to the left. That house is approved to be 33 feet tall from finished floor uh, to the ridge. And the lot for the curb proposal appears to fall more steeply to the front. So that would result in a taller exposed foundation and ultimately the appearance of an even taller structure. Staff recommends that the plans be revised to show the grade of this lot accurately and that the height of the building is revised to be no taller than 33 feet tall from grade at the front. So that was approved by the historic by the commission for the house next door. The front setback will align with the adjacent house uh, and the side setbacks are greater than the typical of the area, but that's mainly because of the lot size. The house here, as I said, includes the attached garage at the rear. The rear wall of the garage uh, is proposed to have a setback, a rear setback of 15 feet. Um, that would need the setbacks for an outbuilding, but because the garage is attached, it falls under the setback requirements for permit. And the house is not particularly deep as itself, uh, so it's a, the, the shallow water is not be sufficient to have the impact. Commissioners can't hear the presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. We can't hear you, Sean. If you want, I can oh. read. Uh, there was feedback, and then there's a lot of feedback during Sean's presentation, and then we kind of stopped hearing him. It was very. I have the script in front of me, so I can read through it oh. if that's easier. I think my uh, my microphone battery died. Did you hear? How far I'm back? Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Sean's got it. Okay, great. Don't we can hear you now. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um. Okay. We want um, about uh, two paragraphs, please. Uh. So I'll I'll just say that uh, I, I think you heard me talk about the height of the building. I'll talk about the I'll start at the setbacks. Uh, the front setback aligns with the adjacent house. Uh, which was recently approved uh, and constructed. Uh, the house does have an attached garage at the rear. Uh, the rear, as I said, the rear wall of the garage will have a setback of 18 feet. Uh, this setback would meet the bulk zoning requirements for an outbuilding, uh, but because the garage is attached, it falls under the requirements for primary buildings, and that setback is 20 feet. Um, the lot is rather shallow at only 101 feet deep, and the house is not particularly deep itself. Um, so together those things uh, result, uh, mainly the size of the lot result in there not being sufficient face, space to have a detached outbuilding behind the house uh, and, and, and maintain a 20 feet separation between house and garage. And for that reason, staff finds that the proposed rear setback of 18 feet would be appropriate. The proposed materials are generally appropriate, uh, and staff recommends a condition that uh, there be administrative approval of window and door selections, as well as roof color and a garage door selection. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed infill at zero Manila uh, sorry, there's some context for this there. Uh, staff recommends approval of the proposed infill at zero Manila Avenue with reduced rear setback with the conditions outlined on your screen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Applicant, if you would like to speak, please announce yourself. Hi, uh, yes, my name is Brad Sayers with Foursquare Design Studio. And uh, 
thanks to Sean's help, uh, we have uh, come to a conclusion on how to reduce the height to 33 feet. And we will address that moving forward, as well as the elevations accurately depicting the grade of the lot. Okay. All right. Thank you, applicant. Do we have any public comment? We, we did receive one email uh, as an objection to the setback determination. There are no other calls on the line. Okay. I think did we have any call, uh, emails or anything? Just one. Okay, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, unless Mr. Sayers has any other rebuttal to the public comment, um, I will close public hearing. Okay. Commissioner Mosley? The question for staff and the applicant can respond. In um, getting the, the height to 33 feet, uh, it seems like it'll be, the front of the house will be, the grade will be lowest in the front, which will make the house you know, appear taller if, if we're setting the garage up as shown in the rear with some retaining or, or just some additional grading on the side. And, here, and now here's to the question, will the roof slope be determine, you know, will be will it be significantly different in order to meet that 33 feet maximum height to the ridge? Uh, this is Sean Alexander. I'll, I'll go first and then the, the applicant uh, can probably uh, expand or correct me. Uh, uh, they did, uh, the applicant did say that they, one thing that they were uh, going to do was, was essentially uh, dig in that garage. Um, so that, that may help get uh, a foot or a foot or so out also this ha this this the other thing is that this house uh, this design is very similar to one that the commission approved uh, adjacent to the right uh, last year or maybe the year before at 913 Manila uh, it's very similar but the house next door has lower ceiling heights so um, and here's where the applicant can can respond but I, I was just thinking that Part of that could also be in just in having this house's ceiling heights uh, more in line with what was uh, approved and constructed next door. But Mr. Sayers may may have uh, uh, other ideas, which we certainly would be willing to entertain. Uh, yes, if you can go to the drawing that shows the elevation, the side elevations. Um, there, there we go. Okay, so. The, the way we've sol solved the, uh, the height issue is uh, we have um, reduced the, the pitch slightly and uh, that will help reduce the height. Um, I, um, I did not submit a copy of that because uh, I did not receive approval from the client until late Monday. Uh, but I will be forwarding updated plans to Sean uh, sometime tomorrow so that uh, we can uh, get him to look at it and tell us whether we're on the right path. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I, I, yeah, I asked that question because especially on the side where, um, well, on the side elevation, if you, if you don't change the spring point and that gets really low, you know, the front changing from say 12 and 12 to 8 and 12, I don't know that that would, certainly architecture would look different, but on the side getting, you know, we'd be reviewing the house that was much more squat and, and might have some um, some comment about that. I just want to make sure we weren't trying to take it all out of roof slope and it yields a, um, you know, on its surface, a very different looking project and one that, that had some other techniques to minimize the, the height. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, um, other commissioners, do you have any questions to staff or a motion? Vice Chair Stewart. I do have to say that uh, this is one of the more unique settings and lots uh, that, uh, that I've seen in the projects. Uh, I think it's a sensitive um, 
construction for that site and the unique characteristics. And with respect to Zippo Manila Avenue, I move for approval uh, with staff conditions. Thank you. Is there a second? Commissioner Johnson? Yes, I second the motion. Okay, there's a motion and I will call the roll. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you, commissioners. We will go forward to 1416 A and B Basketball Street, and Ms. Sajit will be our presenter, and the number to call in is 629-255-1911. Yes, so this is a request to construct duplex infill at 1416 Basketball Street. The 14 to 1600 blocks of Basketball Street have little historic context and many two to three story modern homes were built on these blocks prior to the expansion of the overlay. Given the lack of context, the guidelines state that infill may be up to two stories on these blocks. Uh, staff finds that the height and scale of the proposed infill meets the design guidelines for this block of Basketball Street. Uh, here are the proposed side elevations. And the infill meets all base zoning setbacks. The plan proposes a driveway from Basketball Street with a 12 foot wide curb cut, which meets the design guidelines. The driveway then widens to 40 feet in front of the house to accommodate parking. Typically, driveways should extend at least to the midpoint of the house and not include front yard parking. However, staff finds that the driveway and parking pad can be appropriate in this case, given the lack of historic context on this block. Um, also, truncated driveways and front yard parking pads are, are commonly seen on the 1400 block of Basketball Street. And the property at 1416 Basketball is a fairly shallow lot with a depth of approximately 122 feet that also has no alley access. So given the unique lack of historic context as specified in the design guidelines, uh, as well as the lack of alley access, the, the depth of the lot, and um, the appropriate curb cut width, staff finds that the driveway and parking pad can be appropriate as proposed um, for this location. Okay. Uh, here are some context photos from the street. And in conclusion, staff recommends approval with conditions as set forth in the staff recommendation. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sargent. If the applicant is on the line, please announce yourself. Hi, this is Vincent Bruce. I'd uh, like to thank the commission and staff, particularly Melissa for her hard work um, working with us to, to get this approved. I don't have much to add right now. Okay, thank you, Mr. Applicant. I do, I do have a question. I just wanted to confirm we're having a difficult time because of some supply, supply constraints finding windows. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that when we do, that we could have those approved administratively and not through a hearing. Is that correct? That so, is yeah. correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I chimed in on that one. Sorry, Melissa. Okay, um, do we have any public comment or call in? Yeah. Okay, no call in? Okay, so we're good with public comment and we will close public hearing. And commissioners, questions to the staff or motion? Commissioner Mayhoff. Uh, thank you, Chair Bell. Um, with respect to 1416 Basketball Street, I make a motion to um, approve staff recommendations for the project. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there a second? Commissioner Price. I second the motion. Thank you. I will call the roll. 
Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you, commissioners. Guess what? We're in our last one. <laughs> so we're moving on to the very last project is 305 Broadway. And our presenter will be Ms. Warren and the number is 629-255-1911. Okay, this is an application for the installation of an ATM within an alcove on Broadway. You may recall that the commission required the removal of this ATM sitting on the sidewalk last year. It has been removed as per the commission decision. As a little history, in 2004, the commission determined that ATMs were specifically allowed inside a building or in an alcove, not on the primary facade. The intent was to ensure that ATMs would not be installed in prominent locations along historic facades and that they would not damage or obscure original or historic materials or spaces. The applicant would like to install a new ATM within the recessed first floor in this location seen here. Staff finds that this could be appropriate for several reasons. First, the ground level of this property has been altered significantly. The recessed entry is not historic. Therefore, no historic materials or spaces would be impacted by the installation of the ATM in this location. Second, the proposed location is set well off of the sidewalk. It is recessed about 18 feet. As a result of this recess, the ATM will not alter the rhythm of street, the rhythm of the street or openings. As such, staff recommends approval of this ATM, finding that it is consistent with section three of the design guidelines for new construction and the intent of the Commission's 2004 interpretation of ATMs. If approved, this will set a precedent for just one other building in the Broadway District. I think my applicant is here. I know he wanted to be, um, and I know he wanted to speak. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Warren. And if the applicant is on the line, please announce yourself. Okay. There you are. Um, we can barely hear you. I'm on the line. Hello. There you go. Please announce your name. Yes, my name is Kenny Winchell. Okay. All right, board. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'll be brief. I'm the last one of the day. And thank okay. you for your consideration in this matter. Uh, I did come before the board last summer about that ATM machine. It's the Tequila Cowboy, Jason L. Dean's Luke Bryan complex. And, uh, it was close to the sidewalk and big and bulky, and even though staff recommended to push it back the foot, the board turned it down, which I immediately complied and removed it. I understand that decision and what the look of Broadway should be. I've lived and worked and owned businesses in Nashville and downtown for 20 years. After diligently working with your staff over the past six months, Ms. Warren and Mr. Hoffman, and them guiding me through the rules, uh, this is my proposal, which your staff has recommended for approval, and I followed all the guidelines of Section 3. This property is very unique, and there's nothing close to it on Broadway. I propose to put the ATM back 18 feet from the sidewalk, which will be barely visible inside the wall, and only protruding about an, out at one and a half inches. Mr. Warren can answer any questions regarding the historic aspects, and again, this property is very unique. You can see in the photos the ATM that was there removed and where it will be, and uh, it, it, it's very seamless. And I just want to reread the analysis and findings from the board. Uh, I appreciate it, or from the uh, the staff. Uh, the applicant is requesting to install a new ATM within wall of the recess first level. ATM will be 15 inches by 35 inches and will protrude out a one and a quarter inches. There will be no additional signage or lighting required. General Principle Section 3 states that new construction should be consistent with existing buildings along the street in terms of height, scale, setback, and rhythm. Relationship of materials, texture, details, color, roof shape, orientation, and proportion, and rhythm of openings. The historic streetscape includes a minimum of two-story buildings with walls that extend the full width of the lot, storefront windows, and upper-level punched openings. 
The ground level of this property has changed many times, and the existing configuration does not reflect the historic storefront configuration. The entry doors are currently set within a semicircular recess that is about 18 feet deep, significantly set back from the sidewalk along Broadway. None of the materials within this recessed alcove, include, including doors, walls, windows, signage, stairs, are historic. The proposed ATM will be installed within a non-historic wall to the right of the doors, well off of the sidewalk. It will not damage or impact any historic spaces or materials. The ATM interpretation that the Commission decided upon in 2004 specifically allows for an ATM inside a building where it would not be reviewed or in an alcove not on the primary facade. Although this ATM is proposed within an alcove on the primary facade, staff finds that this ATM could be appropriate in the proposed location for several reasons. It could be appropriate here because the ATM will be installed in a non-historic wall that is part of an altered portion of the facade and is located more than 15 feet from the sidewalk. Such a deep alcove is unusual for the district. Recess entries are commonly only deep enough to allow doors to open outward without blocking the sidewalk. Such a deep alcove would not be recommended for new construction, and there's only one other building with an equally deep alcove. Therefore, approval will not set any type of precedent for more than one other building. The intent of the ATM interpretation was to ensure that ATMs would not be installed in prominent locations along historic facades and they would not damage or obscure original or historic features and materials. This proposed ATM will do none of the above and further because of the deep recess, the ATM will not alter the rhythm of the street or rhythm of the openings. As such, as such staff lines of the proposed ATM could be appropriate in this specific location. And then that was Ms. Warren wrote that very, very well. The recommendation staff recommends approval of the ATM finding that is consistent with Section 3 of the design guidelines for new construction and the intent of the Commission's 2004 interpretation of ATMs. And I'll close and say thanks again to Jenny and Paul, and thank you, Board, for this consideration. God bless you all for the work you do. Mr. Winchell? Yes, ma'am. Is that Mr. Winchell? Yes, ma'am. We, we, we thank you. I think you know the rules quite well. And we would appreciate you uh, passing that on to, to the neighbors whenever that comes up again, because we do have this come up um, more frequently than, than not. So we thank you for uh, articulating all that from, from the recommendation. Okay, uh, do we have any other public comment? Okay, we'll close public hearing. And commissioners, any questions to the staff? or a motion. Commissioner Price. Yes, uh, I move for approval with respect to Thank you, Commissioner. the ATM at 305 Broadway. Okay, Vice Chair Stewart. I uh, second that move. Thank you. There is a motion on the floor and I will call the roll. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Very good. Commissioners, thank you. And I'm um, Vice Chair. Do you have a comment? No, I do not. Sorry. Okay, no worries. All right, uh, that concludes our projects. And I will ask Ms. Ziegler if we have any new business. We do not. Okay. Well, Commissioners, thank you again for another wonderful meeting and applicants for hanging in there with us and also council member withers and i think mr cash was also on there uh, it thank you so much we hope to see you all next month and possibly not virtual we will get that confirmation um, at a later date thank you everyone stay safe This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. 
If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.